I'm driving. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm gonna bogey then. I gotta run there real fast. I don't know what else to do. The beauty was to use this room's audio too. He looks like a fan. <laughs> So let's end this call here. So let's go over here, go into your audio video again, connect your system, but this time call into a video. Call in from a video system. I hope so. Call in from a video system. Call in from a video This one? Yeah, what is that? That's the same thing. One? That's the same thing, yeah. <laughs> or, um, yeah. It's the same thing. You think so? So, Brad, is that this actress? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Keith, is it still not working? Yeah, my, I'm just standing. So we try carries. Robert, are you working? I'm I'm good. I'm ready to go. Why would he be spending? He's trying to connect to 
the Microsoft wireless adapter. He's not going to be able to do it. Yeah. 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 Hey, thanks for coming. We're waiting for our. Oh, it looks like we've got it going here in just a second. Well, I think we can get started and then we'll have the agenda up there and some of the items we'll be able to see on our screen and, and back. Then. So welcome to board meeting. I'll the order. <laughs> um, and the, so we just previously had a work session where we met with some of our principals. Um, three of our principals gave reports and we really appreciate them coming and I can tell you fabulous things are happening in our schools. We're seeing great learning growth, great student connections. And so we really appreciate them taking the time to present us. It's always nice to see what's really happening in the schools and, and to hear from you. So thank you for being here. Um, we're going to begin our board meeting with the reverence by Connie Archibald, and then superintendent will lead us in the flag salute pledge of allegiance. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be here this evening. Um, as a board, as administrators, as uh, concerned citizens, we're grateful, Father, for an opportunity to meet this evening. We're grateful for our school system, thankful for opportunities to excel um, academically. We're grateful for our students. We're thankful for the safety that we've uh, enjoyed. And we're grateful for wonderful teachers who sacrificed so much for our students. We're so grateful for where we are and for the freedoms that we enjoy. We're grateful, Father, for um, one another and opportunities to collaborate together in order to make things better. Tonight, Father, we ask a special blessing upon those participating that that we might be able to have civility here this evening and that we might uh, be able to learn together. And we ask you to bless our hearts and our minds that, that we might um, be more capable of understanding. We, we ask for, for these blessings and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Thank you. Okay, let us move on. Oh, good, we've got it up. So our um, so now we're ready for an approval of the agenda. Um, President, may I oh, make yes. a suggestion? Um, sure. I was wondering if we could move an information item up to uh, right behind public comments to, and it would be the Grouse Creek um, okay. discussion or the information item. Yeah. Yes, I think that's a great idea. We'll move that up right after public comments. So no one wants to be here. Make a motion that we accept the agenda with the uh, suggested modification. A second. Uh, okay, so we have a motion by. Karen Cronin and a second by I heard Brian Smith first um, to approve the agenda with modification of moving the information item up to right after the public call. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we are going to move on to 
sorry, I've got paper gone through over here. Um, so we're going to have uh, our public comment and I have a list of those who've signed up. Let me read our public participation statement so we can all understand this. Um, the floor is open at this time for any residents of Box Elder County to address the Board of Education on items pertaining to education and or the operation of the school district. Participants will be given the opportunity to address the board in order which they have signed up. Individual presentations during this segment of the meeting are restricted to a maximum of three minutes. Group presentations are restricted to a maximum of six minutes. One possible response to the questions or comments will be provided at this time. If additional study is needed to respond adequately to the questions or comments, the residents will receive a written response as soon as possible, and the written response will be read publicly at the next regular meeting of the Board of Education. Due to the rights of privacy of the employees of the district, the Board of Education will not discuss specific employee appointments, employment, or performance at this time. Questions and complaints or charges against particular employees are referred to the superintendent for action consistent with law and or district policy. So with that, um, I have, I'm just going to read these names. I'm just, and we have, gracious. Jay Kyle Tanner, thank you. Henry <laughs> Tanner. Jake Kyle Tanner, Annette Anderson, Angie Cephalo, Heather Turner, Melissa Lyons, and Alex Tanner. So, so we have two for Grouse Creek and then four with the DLI comment. So if we want to do, maybe we could do Alex and Jay Kyle Tanner, those two first, and then we can have the DLI comment after that. So who wants to come first? Robert, I'm just I think that needs to be turned on. Is that odd? I think it's the bottom right when it needs to be turned on. Test? No, it's not. The bottom or right? The bottom right. Down the on the very bottom, there's a well on the other side. I think, I think oh. you're the first one that gets to do it. Yeah. It designated, right? It's hot. <laughs> it's really good. Test. Oh, we're good. That's great. Thank you. Thank I'm glad I can be here to participate and break this in. <laughs> um, uh, my comments are excuse me. My comments are regarding the Grouse Creek School that a few of us have come to be here today about, and I don't think any of us here want that to be torn down. For me, that's where it ends for the future of our children and for the community. I'm grateful for the investment that you're making. And I'm making those tough decisions. I, I am the fifth generation to go through all 11 years of schooling there. And I'm grateful that you're willing to put that but that much investment towards the next five generations. Thank you. My name is Alex Tanner. Um, I appreciate letting me come and talk about the new school um, at uh, I, I'm sad to see it go. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people in the town of Grouse Creek and they're wanting to, to postpone the tear down date. And my fear is that will be the game is postpone, postpone, postpone. As a uh, father has a daughter there at the school, I'm, you know, I don't want to see the school, the existing school tear down, but don't want my kid to just be waiting for something to happen. And uh, I fear that that's what's going to happen. I don't want uh, the end result to be bus to Park Valley is really what I'm, I'm saying. So thank you. Thank you. And oops. OK, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Did you guys hear the order? You guys go. Oh, yeah. good. You're off top. Um, Annette Anderson, I have two children in the um, dual immersion program. And first, I just want to really express my gratitude for the dual immersion programs um, available in our school district. Um, 
I know it's a daunting task for our district leadership, the principals and the teachers to accommodate this program and to keep it running. And I assume that the Chinese program in particular has its own set of challenges and burdens that consume the time and the resources of our district and the schools that host the programs. Um, I just want you to know that every ounce of energy that goes into this program is absolutely worth it. Um, if you ever question the value of the Chinese program, you need to just spend some time with those kids that are learning the Chinese. Just listen to them. Listen to them when they're in their classroom and they're having a conversation with their teacher that's a Chinese native. Listen to them if they're hanging out with their friends and joking around and it's in Chinese. Listen to them as they're reading from a piece of paper that only has Chinese characters on it. And my personal favorite that you'll just have to trust me on this one, but I love listening to my kids when they're talking in their sleep and it's in Chinese. <laughs> it's hilarious. And it's it's just insane to me that that is what is in their head. Um, and that's what that's what comes out. Um, it doesn't take a lot of understanding of the world economic and political situation right now to know that being able to read, speak, and write in the Chinese language could, is going to have a huge potential on the future of these students. Um, not only is it going to change their future, but it's doing so much for them right now in the present moment because learning to speak Chinese is hard. Um, we've had to at home do some extra homework. We've had to get some extra tutoring because learning to speak the correct tones in the Chinese language is a challenge that just isn't anywhere else. Um, but as they learn and progress and see themselves begin becoming better at the Chinese, they learn that they can do the hard things. They're learning resilience and they're learning so many skills from being in this program that's going to um, just uh, change their lives and, and give them success. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is because now that the program is somewhere around 10 years old, it's becoming apparent that there's a few holes in the program. Um, and I think it's time to make just a couple of adjustments and consider what the program will look like in the future if we do or do not close in on some of those gaps. Um, obviously, this is a discussion that's going to take more than three minutes. There's a few parents that are here tonight um, just to give you some glimpses into what we're seeing as parents and to just maybe um, provide a few uh, examples of where we think some improvements could be made with some minimal input with some really important output. Um, we're also wanting to let you know that if you want to continue the discussion in later meetings, um, we're here. We want to discuss these things. We want to share our perspective with you of what we're seeing from the program from our perspective and also of the perspective of our students. Um, and that's a really interesting perspective. Overall, we just want to let you know we love this opportunity our kids have. It's something we couldn't give them any other way and that we're just here to support them and support the program so that it can just really live up to the amazing potential that it has. Hi, I'm Angie Cephalo. Probably know me as the Chinese mom because when Nancy saw me in the hall, she's like, oh, I know what you're talking about tonight. <laughs> and that's true because I have uh, four students in the program and my oldest was too old to join the program, and my youngest isn't in kindergarten yet. So potentially I'll have five students to go through the program. So I have a student who's in 10th grade who is the guinea pig of the whole program. And um, I have watched the program. I love it. I would tell everyone about it. And if you don't choose Chinese, I just feel like it's an opportunity to know that there is the opportunity out there. So I'm always telling everyone, every preschool meeting and everything about um, dual immersion in our district so that they know that that opportunity exists. Um, however, like Annette said, that there are some things that I feel like we can help the program better and stop the attrition that we're having. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight about some of the training that I think these native teachers need. So I am so grateful to you for letting the native teachers come. I know the whole visa thing can sometimes be a hang up. I mean, with COVID, that's even like a bigger hang up, but the kids are learning the dialect from their teachers specifically. And that is such a gift when we go to Bryce Canyon, they can talk to people and everyone comments on how they sound just like native speakers. Um, my kids will be like, I'm like, do they speak Mandarin? And they're like, no, 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 because they know as soon as I know that they speak Mandarin, that we're going to be having a conversation. <laughs> um, I think my 
My um, nine year old is probably on every billboard in China because when we were in Yellowstone, no matter what guys that we were at, she had a picture taken with like a whole group of Chinese people. <laughs> um, so it makes me sad a little bit that um, that we're losing the numbers after we get out of elementary school. And um, I have kids in every grade, so almost. <laughs> so I've, I've looked at the situation, I've talked to parents in those grades, and these are some things that I just want to share with you. Um, number one is class management. When you're in China, there's not a class management. That word probably doesn't even exist because in China, they're either there to learn or they don't come. And they'll just tell their parents like they can't come, you know? And so here, the teachers just really do not have the skills to deal with class management of American students. It's not a gifted program. Everyone can come. Sometimes there's kids who horse around. Sometimes there's kids who are lower in the language and they cause a little bit of a problem. And the teachers really have a gap on how they can deal with it because they just don't have that whole bag of tricks that American teachers have to, to deal with it. So I think by some training with the district, I know I talked to Stacy Lyons, who is the state DLL for Chinese, and she is willing to come and do some things to help because I really feel like once they hit sixth grade, and it's not fun and magical anymore. The teachers are less dynamic. It's more really strict instruction. I give you the information, you tell it back to me. Um, so there's class management problems because the teachers are not as engaging. So I think that that's one thing that will help the program because it seems like as soon as we hit sixth grade, our numbers start dropping. And I really do not think it's from band or anything else. It's not opting out of certain classes. It's really helping the teachers be more engaging with American students. Um, the other thing that I think I saw is a cultural mindset. We're all about mindset in the district, and I really feel like some training on this would help because in China, it's all about weeding out the people who are not top doc. And I've seen that in these American classrooms. Like if you're awesome, like my son, he got a five on the AP test. He's awesome. He's like a brown noser at the class. He's listening. He's paying attention. He's going to credit. Like that is. And I mean, I have all teeth. They don't really like have it up for them, but they're just kind of setting them aside and working on the kids who are cultural things. Think some definitely come down You know, the slow that ever gets to learn Chinese and a little less about the AP test, more about the outcome of when you get out of high school. What you're going to do with this more job shadowing, more internships, more vision of, hey, in Utah, in Perry, in Brigham, you are going to be able to use your language. <laughs> um, and then another thing is the better understanding the grading. A lot of the teachers, after you get to sixth, seventh, eighth grade, they aren't getting the grades submitted in time. Like we don't know where our kids stand. Um, so that's kind of a complication there. Um, you know, I know in the high school level, we had a lot of assignments that were two out of two. So if a kid misses a problem on that at all, I don't think that they realize that this is a college class. These are kids who are motivated to get their education and, you know, blowing out a 4.0 grade average that they've had their whole time with a two out of two assignment. And there's only like 10 assignments for the whole trimester. I mean, that's just some like education and training that could really help the teachers. Um, because I think the teachers are good. I just think like that they lack a little bit of skill on how to be an American teacher um, and teach American students. And that's the last thing I want to talk about is just their enthusiasm in the classroom. It seems like for first through fifth, those teachers are engaging. I don't see a lot of kids dropping out in first through fifth in the program. What we see is like afterwards, it's really strict. It's really structured. It's really, you know, regurgitating the information and they really have got to have some training on how to engage, how to relate. I mean, people take calculus from Parker, not because calculus is an easy AP class, but because Parker makes it fun. He's relatable to the kids. He brings a lot of excitement to the class. We have to teach these Chinese teachers how to be that person, or we're going to keep having attrition. I mean, my son's class went from 60 to, I think they're like at 17 right now. Like that's huge. And it's, it's just relating to them. So I think that it's not that the teachers are bad or the kids are naughty. It's just a gap of training that we could really help those teachers if we just took a little bit of time. And so my my big push is because I love this program. My kids have done awesome in it. I mean, I have Kaiden who's brilliant, you know, and I have Jandy who's, you know, fourth grade and she's coming along and she's, you know, happy little rainbow girl. But um, 
you know, I have a, I have a gamut. I don't have all brilliant kids, but I do know that this is making a difference in their lives. So I want the program to continue. I'm hoping that Golden Spike will have less negativity because there'll be more kids and more options for kids so that it won't be the DLI is the negative thing. But I love this program and I'm hoping that if we fix a few things, then the kids will love the program again and they'll want to stay in it and not just be upset and frustrated. So thank you. I plan to email you my email and you can contact me if you need help. I think a parent council would also be awesome at the district level. I know I've talked to Spanish teacher or parents and they have similar concerns. So it's not just a Chinese issue. And I think having a parent council where the parents can get together and relate some of the things and see successes would be good idea. Thanks. <laughs> Um, once on how I'm Heather Turner. I actually was the fifth grade Chinese teacher for a whole trimester last year because you couldn't get a Chinese teacher to come. So I lived in China for six and a half years. Um, my children, two of my children were born there. I have four children in the DLI program, and I hosted a Chinese teacher in my home for years. So I'm um, well acquainted with the program. And I can attest to what Annette said. I did have a child who came out of surgery speaking Chinese. So it does, <laughs> it does happen. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna read this. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, have you ever wondered why some children thrive in Chinese while others struggle? I believe it comes down to motivation. Parents might have motivations for their children to study Chinese, such as getting college, college credit or using the language in a job someday, but those motivations mean nothing to a six-year-old. Kids are largely motivated by fun, and if Chinese isn't fun, then their motivation isn't there. Concepts taught in other subjects are also found outside the classroom, but the only Chinese that's found outside the classroom is in the shape of homework. Most people don't keep participating in things that feel like all pain and no pleasure. Some kids might find motivation in the sense of accomplishment, but not all children. Here in Box Elder, our kids have little to no opportunities for enriching activities where they can just have fun while using their Chinese language skills. We've talked to parents in other districts, and many have extracurricular Chinese activities. We as parents want Chinese activities for our kids where they just have fun. But he'll start out their Chinese dual immersion program with these activities, but other parents when other parents complained, they couldn't participate, the activities were cut. Not allowing Chinese activities because not everyone can participate is unfair to the Chinese DLI students. Nobody is cutting sports or theater or robotics because not everyone can participate. We actually celebrate the fact that some students get more opportunities than others by paying to be a spectator at those events. We would love to see the school district support Chinese extracurricular activities. We're convinced giving students more opportunities to use their Chinese skills and have fun with Chinese will keep children in the program longer. Our kids need that fun in Chinese as motivation. Speaking of motivation, we'd love there to be some special rewards or benchmark events for different grades. Something that the kids can look forward to as they hear about it from older students. Let's celebrate every other year of achievement in Chinese by giving kids some smaller benchmark goals to look forward to. Just passing the AP Chinese test in ninth grade and getting college credit isn't enough. Some might say taking a two hour exam isn't even a reward. There's so many options for big activities that we could add as part of the program. Cultural events that educate and they celebrate each child has made it that far and encourage them to keep going. We would also love to see some more cooperation between grade levels. The kids that are in higher grades can be mentors and be looked up to by the lower grades if we could uh, enact peer, peer tutoring or reading programs. This would give older kids a chance to use their Chinese in a way that is flattering and fulfilling to them while giving the younger grades aspirational motivation as they aspire to be like those big kids. We also believe that a district-wide Chinese New Year celebration should be coordinated between the four schools. We as parents believe that if you give children more motivation for using their Chinese schools, you'll find students who are engaged inside and outside the classroom. Thank you for your time. We sincerely appreciate your support of the Chinese DLI program. We hope you'll take some of these ideas into consideration.
Okay. Hi, my name is Melissa Lyons, and I have currently two kids in the um, Chinese dual immersion program and one in kindergarten. So she'll be in next year, hopefully. And um, I just wanted to say how much me and my husband have absolutely loved this program. It like, yeah, we're so grateful for this opportunity to put our kids in this program and it has been awesome. Like they've said, just to see the progress of your kids, like when you go in there and you just hear the teacher say something in Chinese and then they say something back to them and you're just like, what? Really cool. So anyway, thank you guys. Um, but one thing that me that I found um, would be really helpful to me and a lot of other parents in the program, um, especially as a newcomer with little kids in the program, is a way in the district um, and not with social media, because a lot of parents don't have it, to be able to connect and communicate with parents one on one, or well, not one on one, to be able to connect and communicate with parents in like a forum or on a website where um, we can essentially communicate with parents all the way from first all the way up to high school. Um, there's been so many times where other parents and I have been talking and it would have been so nice. We'd love to have a place where we could put our questions out there for other parents to answer, um, where we could ask other children, like they were saying too, to ask for help with our kids. if we needed a tutor for our kids, we could ask them, you know, if an older kid could help tutor the younger one and that helps the older and the younger one. Um, so for um, to, to get help or questions, if we want to find out what motivated the older kids to stay in the program instead of drop out, because I'm definitely don't want my kids to drop out too. So yeah, that would be really helpful. Um, we would use this place as a place for parents and teachers also to go on, help answer questions, communicate with each other about opportunities or events um, that are going on with our Chinese immersion community or that if we start creating programs, because I was at a point, uh, especially with this COVID, it's not anybody's fault, but it was, my kids were struggling for sure. I'm like, Angie, my kids were not at the top. <laughs> so I was working really hard to try to help them. And I looked within our district to find tutors or to find programs or um, just something like that. And I didn't find anything. And I had to end up looking outside of our district. I went actually to Provo district and um, signed into some of their programs that they're doing on, you know, and I, it was helpful for them, but it was really sad for me that we didn't have those opportunities within our district that we could help our kids and that our kids could get together with other kids physically or at the schools instead of doing everything through Zoom with, you know, because I'm having to do it at other districts. So I think it would be so helpful to have a place where we could go to to find the events that are out there or just connect with other parents, ask questions, ask them what's helped them. Um, um, yeah, I think it, I think if we did this, it would help. We could help our kids not drop out. We can help our kids find what connects them to each of the other kids and get them using the language more and get them excited about it to want to stay in it. And I know as parents, especially, you know, you've heard from all them too, but we want our kids to succeed in this. And I know like you guys with the opportunity that you've given us to have this program in the district, I know we want to see it succeed too. And I know talking to a lot of parents, at least in the elementary side, because I don't have any kids elsewhere, but we would love the help from other parents, especially to be able to talk to the older ones. And I feel like we have an army of parents out there that are truly willing to help in any way that we can as parents. And we want to be involved and to help out and be involved in programs if, if they were offered to us here in this district. And uh, we would love the help of the district to find a place where we can have that connection with each other and to help our kids through this program. And we'd love the help from the district in creating opportunities and programs for us so that we can help get our kids motivated and want to stay involved and want to actually continue through with it and not drop out of it. And I think we can do this. I know we can do this. Like, we just need your help. So thank you guys so much. <laughs> thank you. We appreciate those comments and I've taken notes and we will discuss those at when we have time, but that is, we, we love the DLI program. I think that we have invested a lot in it, both the Spanish and the Chinese, and we are really grateful that parents are embracing it and the people that are working on it. So um, I just wanted to 
we had a couple, we had public comment open online to this board meeting, and there were a couple that had written in, and this is back to the Grass Creek School. Um, uh, I'll just read these because they're not here to the public comment, so I will read what they publicly commented on via our website. So um, this is from Fern Kimber. Save the school district money, build new school on present property along North Fence, south of gym or along front fence, leave old buildings saving a huge amount of demolition expense, everybody happy. And then from Kayleen Mahoney, um, historic buildings are an important part of our history. Any town or city needs to keep the historic buildings intact as a reminder of our heritage and our ancestors who worked hard to build these structures. I feel people don't appreciate or even understand how important this building is for the historic value of Grass Creek. We live in a throwaway world, and I hope you will consider your plans for the historic Grass Creek School. Please don't throw away our history. Thank you for accepting the public comments on this matter. So those were, um, and we're going to have an information item, but I just wanted to say, like, these, uh, we went out. We want to just go to that information item now. Okay, okay. Um, go ahead. Me, um, since we have a lot of the DLA um, parents here, could we also move the DLA? agenda item after the grass creek move it up so that they don't have to stay is that okay Terry's do that only thing okay no. and okay Ms. Tater could yes. just um like to recognize um, an all around great guy and a former superintendent here in the Barnes Elder School District Richard Kimber uh, back here Richard's a great guy and I know uh he knows a lot about grass Greg and I didn't know if he had any information that he would like to share with us at time. I don't want to pitch on the spot that you're back. Sorry if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Okay. 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 Um, I didn't know I, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> First of all, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you people. I've been there. It's a tough job. So the Grouse Creek School, it is historical. I spent a lot of hours in that building. Not unless it's eroded, my initials are in one of those sand blocks I'm coming <laughs> But I also know that the community of Grouse Creek deserves a nice facility. I also understand that for safety reasons, we have to look very strongly at that old building. It is historical, but the safety of the children in that community is much more important than the history of that building. I love that old building, but I also would like to see a very nice new facility there for the children of that community. It wasn't too many years ago that uh, there was an old stone church out there that was more historical than that school building. It's no longer there. There are a lot of feelings about tearing down that old building. But the people of that community now have a very nice, modern, new chapel to meet in. I hated to see that building go. But I know you as board members and a district will do what's best for the community, for the children of Grouse Creek. I hate to see the building go, but I would like to see a new facility there. Good luck. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Richard. We appreciate your, your input there. Okay, so let's move on to that information item then with the Grass Creek School, and then we will do the 
the DLI as well. So we'll move those back up. Okay, it's um, you looked at the uh, agenda. You were able to see that there's um, a variety of attachments to that. And I've worked with Keith just a little bit. Um, I think what we'd like to do is start off with last Tuesday night, a week ago last night, um, the group of us in the district, uh, Julie and, and Tiffany, went out to meet the group of people and we put together a presentation. So I see Keith has that up there. Um, it was kind of in two parts. I had a part of it, and then Corey had a part of, a part of it. Corey Thompson. For those of you here, he's our uh, facilities director. If you want to raise your hand, Corey. So uh, he's been very helpful in, in working through this. So we put this together. So we'll just run through that really quick, just to give you a background with the next one. Hold on. Come on. There, there it is. <clears throat> Okay, that's uh, a long ways away for me to speak, so I'm going to turn around. I apologize. Sorry. <laughs> I really don't think I need glasses. <laughs> okay, uh, our, our, we have a mission statement, Box Elder School District, and I've been, FYI, I've been a superintendent in three other school districts, excuse me, two other school districts. This is my third. And in each, each district, we have mission statements. But we eat, drink, sleep, and live our mission statement, Box Elder School Districts. And we just believe in high levels of learning for all students. And so, you know, we, we talked about our DLI students. Wow. And uh, trying to make it bigger there. Thank you. <laughs> and certainly all, all students being the students that are in Grouse Creek, because they're just as, I'm sorry, I said Creek, didn't I? I need to say Creek. I apologize. <laughs> I, I believe that's correct, isn't it? I, I, I heard Melissa say it today, so I think it's Creek. I used to fish a lot on Paris Creek, but that's another whole other state. Um, we have a, a committee on our board. Boards uh, can never meet except for in a, a meeting like this with everybody together, uh, except except for at this meeting. And and then so we have these subcommittees. We have a committee called the Capital Outlay uh, Committee, and they get together uh, with Corey quarterly, and uh, if more often if we need, and we talk about the needs of our school district with our facilities, uh, both new buildings. How we need to fix up the old buildings, how we need to take our parking lots, roofs, just everything, grounds, the whole nine, the whole nine yards. And Corey's in charge of that. And we have been meeting, uh, talking about Grouse Creek and I'm keep doing that, aren't I? And um, trying to decide what is best to do. And we've known for quite some time that we needed to do something. And uh, luckily, I believe when when uh, Karen Cronin was the president. She uh, asked, why don't we look at getting a seismic report? And so Corey went to work and, and brought in a structural engineer. And that was the recommendation from the uh, structural engineer. And quite frankly, it was uh, quite a report. And we've never shared that report in public. I am going to do that tonight. Figure we got three more months, four more months of school. And to me, it's a little old scary. I'm going to be quite honest with you. So, um, one of the things we just decided that wasn't the board that voted in May of last year to go ahead and go with this program. And because of it's just because of COVID and a variety of things, we put it off until now, and we'd like to start that new program out there at Grouse Creek right now. And so, one of the things we'd like to do is is uh, you know that that bullet there, save some of the rock and make the monument out front. Keith, you build that next one, please. We have a timeline. Corey, you wanna you wanna speak to that a little bit as you as you as we go along here. So sure. You want to step up to mic, please. Please. And normally we have this set up so you can uh, see with the camera and see the front end, the back of Corey, but he so we're sorry <laughs> it's not working yet. We don't have that set up yet. Go ahead. Okay. So the timeline and I'll address the board because I think a lot of the residents of Grouse Creek were at the meeting. So the timeline right now, as we look at it, we've done the work with the architect and it is now in the process of going to engineers so that we have the right structural integrity to this new building that we would, that we would build. Talking with our contractor, we feel like if we keep going, steam ahead, 
that we would have a good chance of being in the new building next December. It does create some hiccups, hiccups along the way. To do the full job of abating the asbestos and demoing the old building and doing all the site work to prep for the new, and then we would create or build these new structures in Tremonton, then we would transport them out and set them on the on the new foundation. So that whole process, we feel like we would have a good chance of getting that completed by next December. Um, when you say next December, that means 2022. This year. Yeah. This year, yes. Yes, and it would displace the students. Uh, we, we feel comfortable that we could create a temporary situation in the gymnasium where they could hold school. Uh, but our, our push would be, uh, as you know, in education, every minute is every minute counts. But especially once they come back from Christmas break, every minute counts even more because we know that the end of level testing is coming up in the spring and we, we don't want to disrupt education any longer than we would have to. What's the next slide? I, I think Corey, if you'd stay here this okay. and, and talk just a little bit about, you know, he mentioned, he mentioned, uh, basically four, is there, there, there are four portables or four modulars. So the longest, the, the largest building that we could transport out would be the equivalent of two spaces uh, up here on the board. So the way that we would construct them would be on the top right would be the office and the and the cafeteria area. And then on the bottom right would be two classroom portions. Those two structures would be built and hauled out as one unit. And then because those would be, I believe it was 60. I can't read that small up there. I believe it's 60 feet long for those two structures. That's the longest that we can transport out. And they would be approximately 26 feet wide. So that maxes out the mover as to what they can move out there. And then the other two, <laughs> just because of the design of the building, they would be moved out individually. That would give us our linear design. They would be set um, apart from each other. And then additional trusses would be taken out and infill in between the buildings so that we'd create a common hallway there that you can see. That'd be the common hallway. Correct? Yes. Okay. Next slide. And then, well, on that one, so so on the on the right hand side would be the front entrance that would be facing the same direction that the current building is. On the left hand side would be the the breezeway that we would uh, preserve that would connect us into the gym. That was, that was one thing in the initial design of this, as I had said, I don't want these students to have to go outside of the school building into the cold in January to get into the gym. We, we would want to maintain that. And then, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the architect always does renderings so that you can start to envision what the building would look like. It's a little risky because it doesn't mean that that's exactly what the exterior would look like as far as the rock on the outside. Um, but but that would be the, the general sense of it with the front entrance and the, the tower there. That's rock from the old school. No. So, so this would, the problem with using the rock from the old school on a new building is the engineers have to design it for different specifications if you're going to use the natural stone. So this would not be from that and then to try to mill that. So what we would do is um, we, we would keep the, the current rock that that building is made with and do monument, um, whatever we can come up with to try to um, Maintain some of uh, maintain or refer back to that heritage that is there. And then this would be uh, the gym is on the left hand side. So that would just show the exterior and then the breezeway in the middle and on the right hand side would be the front 
entrance. And then down below that, uh, that would be if you were to be standing in the gym and looking toward the new structure. So what you see there would be the breezeway. And then looking over the roof, you would see the back side of that front entrance tower. And then you'd see it from from the front on. You can see the brickwork there of the above the new building that would be the gymnasium. Gym, uh, yeah. And then we see the this next rendering would be looking from the parking area toward the building. So you have the front entrance on the left. And the reason for the difference in the windows, it drives an architect absolutely crazy that the windows aren't all symmetrical, but that that gap there we have um, we have dry storage for the kitchen, we have a custodial area, and so that's why those windows would look a little bit different. But you can see there the current entrance into the breezeway is on the left and then the gym on the far or sorry on the right and then the gym on the far right. And then another rendering down the south side. What a comment, you know, one of the things uh, the current gym is was built in 1980 and it needs a facelift and what the the architect and along with the DWA is actually the president said we're going to paint refinish and make it basically look like one solid new building. Plus there's a, I guess an outshed would have their lawnmowers and everything. We're going to give that a facelift too. So when you're done, it will be a nice, really nice and complete facility. What's what do we got next? That questions. That was the questions. That was for last week. So Keith, if you go to the next one, oh no. I just lost my agenda. What the? There you go. I think that one has. Yeah. Did you want to see the Google Map? Like, okay. Let's go to the Google Map really quick. I think that's Sorry. good. Yeah. Uh, this is this is the facility. And Corey was talking right now. You can see this is the this is the old building that uh, we're talking about, built in 1912. Very historical. Right there is that breezeway. You can see that that white thing is uh, kind of a vent, I believe, on that breezeway. The breezeway is 12 feet wide. So this this building is hooked to the gymnasium with that 12 foot breezeway. And I think I think has some lockers in there mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So that that connects it. I believe, Corey, correct me if I'm wrong. The new building would probably come out to maybe here. It, it would be about 90 feet, so it would come out longer. Even come out further, further than that. You think right in that area is that? Uh, I'd have to measure it out on Google okay. Maps. I wouldn't dare say it, 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 it is going to come out further. Yes. Okay. And right now we have an old uh, play toy out there that we we actually have a new one, but we decided we needed to wait until we had this location to put it in the correct place. Um, you know, as I've looked, I'm not sure what the um, measurements are for pickleball, but we could have some lines in there and have a quarter wide. <laughs> And plus, get some hoops that are a little bit, you know, maybe break away, so we don't end up to that situation. Have a net and have have some nets. <laughs> Mr. Mecham, they, there is nets there, but I did notice one of the rims was bent. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that was in case that's because of the way Mr. Mecham shot, he shot too hard. So hit the board; it would still catch. And I'm not sure where we're talking about going with, with the with the big toy, the new the new big toy. So uh, right now, another thing that's we have to take into account. I believe the septic tank is right in this area. Yes, it's on so the outside. septic tanks here. Um, and and uh, that's some of the things that happened. At a week ago, Tuesday night, when we were there, I made a commitment to talk to, um, to, to those folks out there that we would come back. And, and Corey took on the responsibility of talking with Utah State Risk Management. That's the just FYI for everybody here. That's we basically are insured with Utah State Risk Management, and they insure all of the state uh, buildings, all the state cars, everything in the state is underneath the Utah State Risk Management, along with schools and school districts. So Corey was talking to them, and they uh, and, and the question he was to ask was, is it is it possible to separate a building and have it on the same basic lot as another school, and would you, in fact, insure us? Well, it was such a, a daunting question to them that they've taken it to a committee of, of their, I, I guess they're almost, they're like brokers or what, what do they call them there? They're 
agents and their agents. They actually go out and, you know, if, if we get a car accident, one of them will come out here and basically act like an insurance agent. They go through it. But they have been working on that and they haven't given us that answer yet. But we, we still feel strongly about getting that answer. The other commitment I made was to talk to uh, Box Elder County Planning and Zoning. And I went and talked to them and they just looked at me and said, we have 30 foot setback regulations between buildings. And one of the one of the questions was, could we take that building and just fence it off and basically take the breezeway down and then fence it off somehow here and let the building stay and then take our plan and put it out here. And, you know, there's. I see two or three problems with that. One of them being we would have to in fact dig a new septic tank. You can't take your septic and drain it from here all the way back over there because this has, I believe, the kitchen would be right here. If that's that's how it well, that's how I don't know, maybe the kitchen would be here if we turned it around and made it go out that other direction. Um, another one is we would still have a building that seismically isn't very safe. And um, we're going to show you some pictures in a few minutes. This this structure inside of that, the ceiling and the roof of that thing is is, is a little bit concerning. And so uh, that's we found that out. And basically, the planning and zoning just I don't know. They just kind of looked at me like thirty foot setbacks. So I tried to explain the situation, and and they didn't seem to be very communicative. Like there wasn't. So I didn't push it, but that's where it came. So Keith, if you wouldn't mind, go to go to the struct the seismic report, and this thing's huge, but Corey does have a, uh, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to see the reading, but um, it talks about. Go ahead and keep going down a little bit. There's the gymnasium area, the breezeway area. Go ahead. Then the seismic evaluation uh, talks about scores. There's a lot of you can see. There's a lot of math and. Why trigonometry is important, I'll tell you, you know, the math teacher sitting next to me. Here's the findings and they go through, uh, you know, this is on board book. So you all have this is public information and public knowledge. So as you go down through, um, they keep going, keep option one. That's what I'd like to get to. One of the options is to no change in the existing structure or to continue current use. Continue to use the building has been used in the past with no structural upgrades to increase safety during and after a seismic event. If no seismic event occurs, the building will likely continue to function in it as it has in the past, but will continue to slowly deteriorate. However, there are some damaged and inadequate roof structure elements that should be mitigated as soon as possible to prevent potential roof uh, collapse due to snow or wind loads. We do not recommend this option. Okay, so as far as the school goes, which I know some of the folks out there the other night said, well, let's shut it down as a school, but we'll do this other, but still just to have the facility there that has the recommendation that you shouldn't have it there. The second one, seismically retrofit the existing building. This would likely involve adding several inches of reinforced gunite. Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, spray concrete to the interior face of the existing unreinforced stone exterior bearing walls. Then the existing stone walls would be anchored to the reinforced gunite with hooked epoxy. 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 Okay. Thank you. A little bit angle. Uh, reinforcing steel anchors uh, would require screen tubes. In addition, the existing roof structure should be replaced with modern wood truss system. This new roof structure system and and uh, in this angle, it's hard to and existing main floor system should be positively anchored to the reinforced. Stone gun eyeballs both in plane and out of plane. Thank you. Maybe I can read that a little better. Where was I at? Right. New concrete footings and foundation would also be incorporated into the retrofit. And then it says, see the attached schematic retrofit plan and reference details three and four. This plan and details are schematic only. This option would increase seismic load, resisting capacity of the portion of the building under consideration to an acceptable level and could be done in such a manner to preserve most of the historic value of the building. However, such work is extremely costly and difficult. In addition, it would be essentially to require a complete remodel of the existing interior of the building. We would recommend this option, but it is likely cost prohibitive and the historic value of the existing structure appears questionable due to the addition, additions and infield openings. So they said it's possible, 
but you know, I've worked with Corey. Corey's been our uh, facilities director for three years now, or four years now. I've worked with three other districts, and it's funny how fast they all come up with the same answer to every question when you ask them, can we do this? And I've had multitudes of facilities directors say, yes, we can do it. Do you want to pay for it? And that's that's really what it comes down to. Uh, I know we haven't had an official bid, but um, DWA has basically said they thought that would cost right around $5 million. And one of the questions I had, well, why can't we get bids? And, you know, if one construction company says it's going to be 5 million, I can't believe we're going to get much lower than four, maybe even three and a half at, at best. And then we still have a building that really isn't, I don't think, very efficient and functional for education. So the last one, Keith, if you wouldn't mind roll that up there, is option uh, three. three. Thank you. Yep. Demolish the, si the seismically deficient east portion of the existing building and rebuild a new building with modern materials, construction methods, code requirements while leaving the existing gymnasium area intact. Four mobile classrooms and kitchen buildings could be used in place of the demolished portion and located as required at the site. We recommend this option that it is the most cost effective. So I I think that I don't think I know that you know the board takes very seriously. We believe in, in uh, educating all students at high levels, and but we all the board also one of their main responsibilities is to be um, efficient tax uh, watchers of the tax dollars. They they have have to take that very seriously, and so I know as we've talked about that, it's been very important. I'd like to go on with the report. So, Keith, if you wouldn't mind. Let me scroll down. Yeah, let's right. Yeah, a little bit further. In, whoops. Let's let's see the the, the region of seismicity, and you can see. I don't know if that's purple or blue. I, how do we bet? The blue. blue. I go blue. Yeah, <laughs> Keith. <laughs> okay, okay, but you can see very high if it's blue or purple. Scroll up just a little bit, Keith, please. And you can see Box Elder School, uh, basically almost all the, well, all of Box Elder County is considered high, high seismic uh, activity. And so we've been toying with, uh, you know, we've been very fortunate uh, that it hasn't gotten any worse. Um, let's keep going down. I think we're going to get to look at all that math. That's just bizarre. But that's all the, <laughs> all the work they did. You know, people say, what do you need math for? Well, let's get to stuff like that. We're trying to get to the, to the pictures. And uh, you can see how much work they did. There's a picture of the building right there itself. Beautiful. It's really kind of a cool old building. I imagine Richard Kimber and RC or an RK somewhere up there, isn't it? Is it on this side or the other side? East or west? Well, I'm not going to tell you where. Because I, I, I actually heard that story and I walked around and tried to see, and there was a lot of scribbles and scratches in, but I. I'm sorry I didn't see an arcade, but I'm sure I didn't cover the whole thing. That was last week, so. Well, it may not be there, you know. It's been 90 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's been promoted on. It's been fine. Yeah. Uh, some more pictures. You see the snow on it. Um, keep going. Here's up in the up in the roof section, and uh, I believe it was after. Corey, tell me when we decided to go up there and look at things. You mean when we... Do you mean when we did this seismic yeah. study? Well, no, when or we, when we went up and did some of this reinforcement of our. Okay, so that was before I was facilities director. So it's been more than. So before. it's been a few years, but apparently there was an earthquake and it caused some damage up in the roof structure. So they put those vertical support guys in there to try to mitigate some of the potential risk. Okay. And you can see, you know, they, this is, I'm sure this is some of the ones that were put in. To help support it, it's a little scary, but I don't think I don't think that bow is supposed to be in there. So you know that's there. Keep going, Keith. We'll just run through them. You know, there's some. There's that bow. I don't know if that's the same one. That's how you know it's working. Just trying to get <laughs> trying to get that up there. Uh, just some more examples of what's what's going on up there. Trying to support it, and keep it safe as best we can. Just some more push. Uh, there's a picture just a little further. I'd like to see the from the inside the eroded wall. I think you can see that. That's from the inside, and you can see how that thing's eroding and chipping and falling away. And that's on the inside where it's I think dry all the time. And so, let alone what's going on on the outside. So that's some of the concern you see how it's falling and 
chipping down in there. And so and how long ago was the report? This report was two years ago. In like 20. Fall of 19. About 19. I, so think two and a half. The, I think the date on that. Oh, okay. On the night February 2020. I think is this okay. is this down is this in the in the basement? No, that's up. That's still up above. Right there. Okay. And I will tell you that these two ladies went downstairs, or at least part of the way downstairs. <laughs> Out there. Uh, just, just uh, a lot of pictures. So I, I think with that, Keith, um, one more I wanted to look at. Up there. Shows the exterior. The exterior, exterior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, there it is. Yep. And I think this was the corner that actually sunk uh, with that seismic mm, activity. No, I think I no that was that the kitchen side. I, this is, I don't think this is the kitchen. No, side. this is on the south side. Yes. Yes. Keep going. I, is there a couple more that just show some of the outside? Mm -hmm. You know, they put concrete over there to try to make it look a little better. Um, I'm not sure what was in that hole at one time. Richard, would you did they used to have a fireplace or? Something I be south side. Where, where is that? On the other side? South side. South side. South side. It was um, an entranceway. Okay. There were doors there and a little porch just like the front. Just another way to come in. And that school was heated by a coal furnace. And the downstairs, the only downstairs you have is the coal bin okay. and the furnace room. That's all. Yeah. There's no downstairs. Saw that. That whole thing. So, um, I think I think that was there one more. The yeah, yeah, that's is that the kitchen area? That's on that's, that's right. You got to keep going. on twenty eight. Keep going. Keep going. Twenty eight. Right there. You can see how much. I guess I don't know. Grout, what is that that we put in there? Bone years. Yeah. So I, you know, and I, I, I think everybody knows, and and we've even heard it here tonight, and from the folks who ask us, you know, to try our best to save it, 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 it's historical, and you know, my fear is, is if we did, if we could have subdivided it, we could have saved it, who, who would we donate it to? And we can't donate. That's something that's been decided. Who could we sell it to? And you know, it, it occurs to me. I wish I'd have taken a picture. But as as we drove into to, to Grouse Creek the other night, I was I was I, I was mesmerized by this incredible red two story building, red brick. As you come in to town, it's on the right side of the road. And and I said to myself and to the ladies that were in the, the car with me, how how does a, a neat building that probably once was maybe the mansion of the whole Grouse Creek, set the town of, end up with no roof? And, and cave down through, and I believe it's actually isn't it isn't it your heritage? My mother was raised in that house. Okay, so when that's after we everybody did. moves out, that's what happened. And I and I, you know, we get the very first meeting I went to five years ago, at uh, and it was in the old boardroom. We had a patron that really chewed the board up and down about but the Bunderson School. And how it looked, and how many weeds there were, and how horrible it looked. Well, we were actually leasing it to some another, I won't say who, that <laughs> entity. Thank you. And it wasn't when you lease something to that entity, you don't go do lawn care for them. And uh, the night we were out there, I can see a couple of faces. They talked about one of when you folks lived by the old ethnic school. It's gone to disarray. Um, I, I've heard some comments about our. Old Garden School. It doesn't look as like nice as we'd like, and we still get we still get abused for that at times because we, you know, I I don't know if abuse is the right word, but we at least get comments saying, "Boy, how can you let that go and you let it go like it is?" And I I, and I guess our fear is is if we did find a way to do that, what's going to happen? Who who's going to pay the I don't know hundred thousand dollars to re-roof that thing? Two hundred? I I don't even know. Probably more than that. Well. Replace the entire roof structure. Yes, exactly. And so eventually, there would be a super wet snowstorm, and one day, poof. And then, what would we do? And so, also, you know, the idea of putting the T on on the uh, the side of the gymnasium, 
and going that way, it just it doesn't make sense because we would definitely have to come up with the new septic tank, the entryway. That lot is only 1.7 acres, and we feel like we want to. You know, they talked about. I think they have track meets out there on that. Correct? Don't we get to take turns sometimes and go out there? There would be basically very little, if any, green space. And so, in the long run, I, I've tried. You know, my best to do our due diligence. We'll hear from Corey's group, but. What I told the folks there that night was I would bring this to the Board of Education, talk to them again, and ask them if they wanted to consider, you know, putting it on the board agenda and having a different action item. That would have to be in April's board meeting. I told them I would do that. However, as a superintendent, I have a responsibility basically to give you my opinion, and you guys know full well that you can take my opinion and do with it as you please and i fully support that but my opinion is is we need to proceed forward with the the plans that we've made and and uh go forward with, you know tearing the building down there's a lot of work there uh, there's asbestos abatement the day the kids are out i think we start with that then there's uh you know quite a bit of work to take that down we've committed to building some so taking some of that stone and building some sort of a marquee a monument i i'm not sure you know nothing overly huge but but something and so I, you know, this isn't an action item. It's not something you as board members can, can vote on, but certainly during tonight or else during the month, you could give a presentator and let her know how you feel. Nancy? So I've, I've been on the Capital Committee, uh, the Capital Group. I love the Grouse Creek School. It is the cutest, most perfect, wonderful little representation of a Utah school. And I would not let my children go in that building. Uh, in all honesty, uh, my sister, I talked to her. We got an email from gal on the Bear River Heritage site. My sister's on that board and we talked about it at length. And um, with my husband, I restored an old Victorian when we came in this is town and, and I've done a lot of historical stuff. Some things I have thought about and as we've talked about this, you guys are really, really creative and do cool stuff. A couple of things that I I have seen. I've seen um, if you're outside of Tory, they've got a nice, they've got a, a, a stone structure built with a like a laser um, of a building of the mill on top of it, and then history on those stones of what it looked like. But I've also seen some really cool things where they, to scale, taken metal and made the outline of the building and welded it and put it to scale. We could do something. You could do something. I mean, my husband's going to build sack of furniture here. So, you know, I know you guys can do this. But if you came up with a scale model in metal and put it on top of the stones out in front of the school, and then we do inside, we have displays of pictures of the building. Uh, if you've been out to Rose Young and different places, we have memorabilia of these schools. And I think. I like to say, I haven't talked to the rest of the board, but I, I lay at night and think about Grouse Creek School because it is so cool. <laughs> but I think we could do a representation of what the school looks like to, uh, you know, a scale that people would get an appreciation and understanding of what this was like, and then put it on those stone rocks or the stone, the carved stone, and make. I mean, I think it, I think there's so much we can do with that, but. I've got five kids and we lived in an old Victorian house and we prayed when we moved in that it wouldn't fall down until we got everything done. We had to have Lloyd's of London and sure because nobody would even touch it. And it's we loved it. We had a great time and it's a wonderful part of our history. And I appreciate really cool historical things. And I think your kids deserve a wonderful new school with buildings and air conditioning and heat that works. And your teachers deserve a place they can go. But there's ways that we can commemorate this and do some really fun stuff. And depending how the there's probably not metal girders inside you can use for the welding. I haven't scratched that, but <laughs> but I just I know as a community, you guys have have great ideas and tremendous talents. And I can just see this really cool little house, little replica of the school out in front that I think people would really appreciate. So that's my two cents, but I love your school. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. And I, uh, when we went out to that meeting last week, I 
told the community members there they could email me, call me, and I've received about a dozen or so emails from community members or former community members. And, you know, everybody loves the school, but safety has to be a priority and and we have to look and, and that's why we did the, you know, can we keep constructional engineer and can we even subdivide the lot? We've really looked at things, but and we really need to move forward, I think, with this. And so I'm I'm on I'm with the superintendent. I think we need to hit the ground running as soon as we can when those schools get out, those students get out of school um, to move forward and make this happen. And I, I didn't make mention of this, but I think just everybody in the audience and out there, um, we haven't had bids yet, but um, we've been told they think roughly we can do this for two, 2 million or maybe a little bit under. And so it's still quite an investment. You know, I met, made mention out of the meeting that night. We feel like we have no clue if there's ever going to be any growth or not, but we feel like this could easily hold, you know, 18 to 25, even 30 kids if it, if it needed to be someday with those, with the uh, different rooms that we've got in there. So it'd be possible to, you know, follow much like Park Valley and, and even what Snowville does. Snowville doesn't, of course, have the, the upper grades, but Park Valley does. So we, we feel like we've taken care of the future, present, and we're going to have a good solid structure for a number of years. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the board on this information item? We really appreciate that you folks from um, Grass Creek coming out here. We know that's a long way. <laughs> I remember last week. So thank you for being here and supporting the district and supporting your students and your teachers out there. It, we appreciate the input and we value the input that I've received. Like I said, I've received about a dozen emails to try to respond to those. And um, we really want what's best for our kids and for your community and our district. So thank you. Um, we are going to move on to our DLI information item now. So yeah, you don't have to stay. Welcome to go back on the road. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Okay, it's like an awkward, I don't know who to face. <laughs> I'll stand this way. Hi. So I'm Ashley Nelson. I am the goal merging coordinator for Box Elder School District. In addition to my job as the principal of Willard. Um, so I have some information for you on our attrition data our dual immersion. So this first graph just shows you um, students who were enrolled in a dual immersion class in first grade, how many of those students are were still in the program through ninth grade. And if you're familiar with dual immersion, in ninth grade is when they take the AP test. And as they pass the AP test, they go on to the bridge classes, which are the university level classes. So we were in in regards to this data saying that the dual immersion program is through ninth grade. Okay, so the 2012 data, um, those are our current juniors. So they were our very first group of dual immersion students in Spanish. And so that group of students, uh, by the time they were done with the program in ninth grade, 48% of them were still in the program. We were building the program at that time, trying to figure out and what to do. So 2013, these are our current sophomores. So of our current sophomores who um, began in first grade, 53% of our Spanish and 45% of our Chinese went all the way through the program in ninth grade. And then 2014 would be our freshmen. And then you can see going through what that means. Some of these students aren't through ninth grade yet. So this just shows you where they were at as far as last school year. So our 2021 are our little second graders. So that's our data there. Um, Keith, if you want to go to the next slide. Thank you. No. Oh. Try this. That might be a little bit. Do you guys have the next slide on worse? The next slide. You know, I only have one. one. That <laughs> might be why I couldn't find it. Yeah. <laughs> You want to email that? Email. I would love to. Well, that's going through. Do we have any questions about that piece? From anyone? I can tell you that your concerns about attrition and dual immersion is not specific to Box Elder. It's something that is a problem across the state. I just had a state meeting yesterday where um, we talked with all the leaders from all the different districts on what we can do um, to help people stay in the program on a statewide level. 
So that is something that we have some task forces going through where I'm working with other district leaders to see how we can help. So that is not a specific concern to our district. Do you know how the numbers compare to ours? I don't. I haven't seen their numbers. I know that COVID was a big concern. COVID hit dual immersion hard. Obviously, the whole premise of the program is that you're immersed in the language for most of your day. And so when you're at home and you're on the computer and you're not immersed the way that you're supposed to be, our students struggle quite a bit with COVID. Okay, this next one, and I'm so sorry you don't have that in front of you. This one is looking at summer attrition. So this, that first column is our first graders, uh, the history of our first graders the whole time that we have the program. How many of them moving from first grade to second gr grade stayed in the program? So, and then second graders who stayed in for third grade, third graders who stayed in for fourth grade. So you can see um, through elementary school, our numbers are really high. Most kids are coming back every year through elementary school and even sixth and seventh grade looks pretty good. It does drop from seventh grade to eighth grade. Um, I mean, there's a few different reasons for that. Some of that is they're going into the middle school and there's all these fun electives that they can take now and they're wondering, do I really want to give those up so that I can take Chinese or so that I can take Spanish? Um, they could be choosing a career path where they're saying, I don't really know if I want to go to college, if I need an AP score, if I want to take college credit, um, but I can speak some conversational Spanish or conversational Chinese because I've been speaking it for seven years going up to this point, and maybe that's all that um, they want for their future. There's a, a couple different reasons why that is, but that is across the state. We're seeing that our numbers are dropping in middle school. And then that very last slide. So this is the same summer attrition, but instead of showing you by grade level, this is showing you by year. So these are all grade levels, how many are coming back. So the blue is overall, the red is Chinese and the yellow is Spanish. Like the average of like all, all the first graders. All of the first graders, 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 graders and so yes, all of our students. Some of these students have moved out of our district boundaries, out of the school boundaries. Um, obviously the ratios are a little different because we have many more Spanish students, so it represents quite a quite a big gap of you know. Chinese, how many do you have in the district? Two students. Okay, we tried sixty. Um, right now we are doing our dual immersion lottery tomorrow, uh, um, and our. That are for our Chinese program, I have 36 right now. We would like to have 60 for a full, a full program. And in, in, in Spanish, Spanish across the district, um, it's a little different. I believe Garland's at 78. So I see that those are not. Uh, North less. And they have about 30 minutes, so we're hoping those ones that don't get into Garland will definitely get into North Park if they choose to do that. Um, Willard having a lottery, we have 60 people applying for Willard, so 10 of them won't be able to get in. Lakeview, it was perfect because they had 29 from one, one person, and we don't have a Chinese. You said 60 applied to Willard, but you didn't say 70. 70. Okay. I'm sorry, 70 applied to Willard, and we can take 16. The good news with what that information is, is that everyone that wants to be in a program can be in a program if they're willing to do the Chinese. Do you know I mean? On the north end, the Garland kids will be able to get into North Park. And anyone down here involved in the Willard Lottery have an opportunity to be part of a DLI program if they to go to Chinese. To go to Chinese. I have That's a question, like how many people like that want the Spanish, but don't get in, then go to Chinese? Is that a high percentage or is it? So when you put in for the, lottery, you have a first choice and a second choice. Um, 
And I didn't look at the exact numbers, but there were a few that said that Golden Spike would be their second choice if they didn't get into. Most of them, when I was overseeing it, they, they, most of them want just the experience. If they preferred the Spanish, then that was their number one choice, but it wasn't, most of them wasn't, they would go to book trips. They, they, they would go and do the Chinese. It was just about that they wanted their child to be able to have that experience of sure. do the dual language. Right. And I talked to Carrie today too, because even those that didn't put Chinese as their second choice, if they're on my waiting list at Willard, I'm going to give them a call and offer it to them. So hopefully we'll get a few more there. And that was so. my follow up question. So I know in the years past, at this time of year, there, the Chinese is typically lower, mm -hmm. but by the start of school, it's closer to being filled. Is that true? Or Maybe I could. So my vantage point of all of this, so I speak Chinese a little bit. I have to say Indian, Indian. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I love that language. I know that it's challenging. Um, so I, but I, my, I look at it straightly from numbers and bodies and people. Next year, um, there's going to be 45th graders. Fourth to fifth grade in Chinese. In fourth grade, we're going to have 30. In third grade, we're going to have 34. In second grade, we're going to have, so this year we have 48. So we're assuming no attrition. So we're, we're not getting, you know, we're just at 50%, maybe 60% is in terms of trying to get to 60. And I want that number to get to 60. Everybody does. Um, we saw the, the dip from getting there when Willard uh, Three Mile Creek decision opened up. And we saw this numbers go directly down. From a human resource standpoint, again, we're about kids, but when you start to talk about numbers, it does cause a struggle when we can't get 60 or 55 or 50. It just, we have an extra teacher in every grade than we should. And so when you take an amount of approximately 80,000 per teacher as an average cost and you times that by five, that's almost you know 400,000 to a half a million dollars we're paying extra on staff to bring this program along. And so we have to do, I guess, other things so that we can get our numbers up. And that's just elementary speaking. When you hit high school and they don't get, excuse me, intermediate, middle, high, and they're not taking a half a day, they're only taking maybe two class periods a trimester, to try to get a full time teacher, a full load with numbers that are small becomes even greater impact on. So, I mean, our high school bridge teachers not teaching many kids. We want them to, we want this to go up, but it's a major financial investment right now, which I'm okay with. But if our numbers don't start coming up, it is really, it's a, I don't want to say a number, but I would guess three quarters of a million dollars heavy. To run the program. I think yeah. one thing, Keith, um, when you said 34, just so the folks know that means that's two classes. So that's two two classes like, of 17. Yeah. And two that's classes what you mean 17, two classes by, by, by when you talked about bodies, you're talking about teachers and, yeah. and, and all that. So Definitely. when we have you know 60, we have two classes of 30, and we get that hopefully because we know there's going to be some attrition. So that maybe by the time they're fifth, sixth graders, there's still at least 25. And when you start at those low numbers with attrition, you know, and I was I was interested in in what these um, ladies uh, shared with us tonight. And you know, Ashley's the one to talk about that with Carrie's help, my help, uh, and we can, you know, I the, the the forum you referred to. I think that's something that we can help you with the structure. We have Robert Gordon right here. I'll volunteer his help. I don't think we can support that as a district, but we can certainly help you how to, you know, set up the Facebook page or. You know, get that word out there, at least that that, you know, whatever that the case might be. But yes, I think um, not to be like offensive, but I think that some of the things that you're assuming are not true because not once uh, my children have been in the program. Has anyone asked me as a parent how we're doing what we could change? You know, when you're saying you're assuming that once they get into middle school, it's because of course selection. It's not. It's the things that I'm telling you tonight. That could make a change, you know, as far as like getting the numbers up. I know, like, I'm from Perry. We, a bunch of us, like, we're like recruiting the neighborhood, like, let's do this, you know, and 
So when Spanish came, it was a hit, but really, have you sent flyers to all those Mountain View kindergartners letting them know, not just the newspaper who nobody reads anymore. I mean, how many people get the paper? Like we do, but I mean, really, like how are you getting the word out? Like I'm talking to everyone at public theater, at the, you know, the library thing, like just have you heard? I'm not trying to convince you because I've had friends in the program that have quit, but we are not doing the job as a district of helping moms, new moms with new kindergartners and stuff, even know that the program exists if they're- I was in the district and I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. The teacher told me, well, you know, the yeah, high school is like in the school. We don't have to have those 34 numbers because why have we not been getting Mountain View on board for like a long time? Why are we not taking these kids who are incredible and having them teach the kids something fun at Mountain View and, you know, or teach the parents something fun? You know, it, it's not about me helping my kids with homework, you know, and so parents have that stigma. Just an FYI, we, we had public comment, and, I, and I'm sorry because we've already spent a tremendous amount of time. And so it'd be, it would, I need to let you know that it would be up to this. I need to put yeah. that pressure on the president. <laughs> but I, I, I think that I'm willing to commit myself and Ashley. Gary is retiring this year. Gary from the secondary to meet with you folks. And, and then we can actually, you know, the board will definitely give us the, the go ahead, you know, but as far as policies and the things that the board can do, uh, they're kind of limited on helping with this. I know Brian has a daughter that's in the Chinese program been very supportive. He actually asked for this report tonight and, you know, just to see where we're at. So this has been, I don't know if you're here because of that report or if it's just the timing that you wanted to come now. I, I, <laughs> oh. And so, you know, we're willing to, 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 to meet with you folks, you know, I, the, so I just the, uh, Ashley as a yeah. council that wanted yeah, to and I, I'd be glad to talk about that parent council. Really? And, we're not mad. We just no, be so I, 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 <laughs> we're all, we're all on the same team here. So yeah. more. We, we are. And that's why I don't think we need I'm sorry, I don't think we need your comment because we are on the same team here. Yeah, right. And I'm willing to commit, you know, okay. Ashley, I guess I am her boss, so I can't commit. At <laughs> least to this, I can't commit her to, you know, to somewhere else. So, so uh, we, we will do that. And yeah. you know where to reach her. She's Willard um, principal. And we'll, we'll, we can go from there. And we, we really want, because if you can see, we want to support this program. And we were excited actually to bring, you know, the two schools together, hoping those numbers would, yeah. would, would really help us. And I think one of the things that I heard, um, like the Mountain View parents, this was when we were talking about combining the schools, they liked Mountain View because it was a non-dual immersion school and they were worried about coming to a dual immersion school. But I think once we're there and they get a feel for the program, I think when you're in it, you see it, it's better. And so I'm hoping that we have, um, but like, but like I have a daughter that's I have two daughters that are in dual immersion Spanish, and I had other kids and I could not drive them to the other part of town to do Chinese. And my one daughter didn't get into the Spanish until after Thanksgiving. And so I, there's lots of issues, but we want to spread the word. I think the ideas of having cultural events and community, you know, things like that can build the program. And we will definitely I, I wrote down all your ideas. Well, we will take those into consideration. And I think, like you said, Ashley is our kind of our point person on this that we can we can start moving on those kind of things. But we do. I mean, we have invested seriously in this these this DLI program for the district, and we want the experience for as many kids as possible. And and some kids are just intimidated. I mean, our parents might be intimidated by the Chinese language, and so having a greater community feeling of it would help them not feel so scared. Cause like I speak Spanish. So if my kids speak Spanish, I'm like, I don't know what they're talking about. I'm Chinese. I'm like, uh, are you gonna make this stuff up? So, um, but anyhow, we really appreciate you coming in. We will, we will take that into account and we will move forward with that. So, so can I make you. Uh, yes, please, Brian. Right. Yeah, it's superintendent mention that I have a, a daughter that's in ninth grade. Uh, a week ago, um, I sat and listened to her um, speak Chinese to a, uh, someone on a Zoom meeting uh, in preparation for the AP test. And my job just dropped at the, how she can, I mean, you can tell um, because I speak Spanish, you can tell when somebody is not understanding or having to speak slower and and, and they're just, you know, it's both of them, she's responding very fast and the, the teachers are uh, uh, talking very fast. Amazing what, what they're doing, but I have been there. I can echo everything that said tonight the concerns that I've had as a parent with a, a child, Chinese uh, culture is very difficult and everything that is stated and it's, it's obvious in the numbers. We're seeing the 
the, the Chinese is dropping, it, it has significantly lower retention than Spanish, and, it, and it's a culture thing, and we've heard that. Um, and I, I think they've got some great ideas, and and I really think that we need to to um, put some resources into maintaining this program because it's so critically important. Uh, my son was in the dual immersion Spanish, and he's a sophomore, freshman this year. Who I'm skipping him ahead. He's a freshman, <laughs> but he left the program. Um, we fought it and fought it, but he left the program, and so the things that these Moms came and spoke to us tonight really struck a chord because it wasn't just because it wasn't about electives. <laughs> it was some other cultural issues and, and it was the Spanish. Not I love the program. I'm so I was heartbroken to see him leave it. So if we can find a way to keep kids like my Thomas into these programs and really interested as they get older, I'm all for it. So thank you. Okay. I think that's Thank you for coming. Thank You're thank welcome you to stay. We could leave. We have all sorts of exciting things to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all you. of these. <laughs> Sell it. Okay. I know. Uh, I'm sorry. Fall, some policies and budgets. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. We'll go back to where we were on our agenda. So we're going to go to our action items now. Um, so approval of our negotiations team. This would be Keith. Yes, every uh, you know the the state legislature just finished up um, with all their uh, laws that were you know, talked about, vetoed, passed, all of that, and uh, obviously there are several educational laws uh, that'll all be kind of worked out in terms of nitty gritty uh, with uh, Superintendent and Rod. And uh, anyway, our anticipation, the latter part of April, first part of May, uh, that we will start negotiations with our uh, BEA, our teacher association, and then our BSPA, Box Elder Educational Support uh, Association, that would be our classified folks. And so we've got uh, a group of administrators to help uh, on our, I guess, I don't want to say on our side. I always go into those feeling like we're all on this team together. And we kind of negotiate against each other. We're all playing on the same team. But anyway, it's been a great experience. But um, anyway, so those are the three things. BESD, myself, Rod, Steve, Jerry Jackman, uh, secondary representative, uh, Megan Bushnell Elementary, uh, BEA, Steve Littlefield, a teacher at Barrett High, Andrew Fawcett, a teacher at Harris, Michelle Bowden, a teacher at ACYI, Pamela Hawks at Barrett High, Michelle Smith at Box Elder High, Robin Smith at Fielding, Mark Harland is at Young Intermediate, and then Curtis Benjamin is a Northern Utah Unit Serve Director. Philip Albright is a custodian uh, at North Park. Melissa Lemon is at uh, Young Intermediate. Rhonda Schaefer here at the ILSC. Noel Christensen is a lunch manager. Uh, David Cook. Um, there's two David Cooks. This is a custodian. Berlanda Stevens, uh, Secretary of, uh, and then Damian Portillo. Um, so he turns all of our wires that you can't see uh, in all of these rooms. Uh, and then Jan Christensen is a, a, a bus driver. So Tim Bell. But anyway, I would just move that we uh, approve these folks uh, as part of our negotiation team for the 22-23 uh, upcoming negotiation. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the 2022-23 negotiation. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion by Brian Smith to approve the negotiation teams, as mentioned, and we have a second by Nancy Kennedy. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> okay, the one point of information Curtis Benjamin, our USERF guy, was filed to run for the State Board of Education against Jenny Earl. Ooh. But he's running as a Democrat, so it's going to be an uphill battle in Utah. But anyway, I was tickled that he was willing to take that on. There's some deep pockets supporting Jenny Earl. So anyway, so Curtis is going to be running. Oh, that's interesting. Do you want to get in there? Go oh, Curtis. <laughs> so the state board is not nonpartisan like we are. They are not. They're not. They are not. They have to come through. They have to come through their local political. And we are fighting tooth and nail to keep the local boards. 
I do have a question on the negotiation. Is that so each of those um, groups, do they choose their own representatives? Or These are the representatives. Those are the representatives they choose. They choose. They choose. That's what I mean. We chose BESD. Yeah, they they choose. choose and then they submit to me and then I present. Do they you. change very often from year to year? Yeah, there's something? always one or two every year that changes. About how long do they serve? Well, I've only been here four years. Um, we always try to rotate our administrators every two years, so they serve for two years and then they're off. Um, from the BEA standpoint, we've had uh, looks like about five out of seven are the same, and from uh, FISPA, probably six out of nine, seven out of nine. So they get we try to rotate people. Thank you. I appreciate that information. All right, we have a couple of trust land amendment plans. Um, building at McKinley. Uh, Carrie has provided those, and I think you read those. Are there any questions on the things to do? He just made the changes because he just saw because of personality and were unable to find yeah. And then trying to keep it from their carryover and street with more than 10 percent. So trying to take in that account for this year. So so it's not having carryover. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that for the trust lands? Okay, I'll move. We approve the trust lands amendments to build fielding and McKinley Elementary as proposed and signed off on by the board. So we have a motion by Nancy Kennedy and a second by Tiffany Summers to approve the amendments for the trust lands for building and McKinley schools. Um, any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, those are approved. Uh, Gary, approval of work based learning program. Okay, thank you. I want to recognize uh, Raquel Brinkerhoff. She's been patient uh, through our meeting earlier, but she represents Vera Rabai. Jesse Roberts uh, is, represents Fox Sellerby. I think you saw in your handout that there are many things at the work based learning. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, I think um, if, if you look on your uh, document, uh, the there's a couple things that I just uh, mentioned really quick. First of all, we have a wide comprehensive program K through 12, and we have a variety of experiences. Most recently, we have the STEM fair out of the county fairgrounds. Uh, that was really amazing. Just some great things for the kids there. Uh, there are several things that uh, we participate in at each level as they go along. Then. Uh, the business partners and the internships, we have amazing business leaders that will uh, support our kids and get out into those workplaces for their internships. So the, the rule says that in the work-based learning standard two, uh, we do need to receive uh, approval for our work-based learning program. And so I would like to make the recommendation that you approve um, our work based learning for 2022 2023 school year. Any questions? I do have a question. How many students do we have involved? I we, think it was in there. I did read it. Yeah, it was. Uh, we have about 50 students per trimester divided, and, and I think Raquel's kind of a little higher on the numbers right now, but 150 for the school year between both high schools. And that's so we're. That might be about all we can take. There are some companies that won't take it because of their age. If they're not old enough, they can't be in there or would have more. But these businesses are awesome. And so we're, uh, the numbers that we gathered before our report was 150 for the year. I just saw that right now. That yeah, that's all good. With that, I make the motion that we approve the uh, explaining. Second. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Karen Cronin and a second by Wade High to approve the work based learning program for so just the kind of do we just do one year? Is that what this is yes. for this next year? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank so, you. I, I, sorry, I have another question. So the governor's this new thing of adopt the school. Right. And doing is there any chance we could leverage some of that with this, or do we have most of the companies? Doing things that they, they can. Raquel, can you? Could we get more businesses, or do you think we're about there? We always take businesses. <laughs> <laughs> always, because you have to remember, our big thing is we might have a business that comes to us that says, "I want an intern." 
That's not how we run our program. It's we get the kids and then we try to find a business that aligns as closely to their career goal as possible. So we're always looking for businesses that are willing to. Well, because the governor's big push is for industry and businesses to adopt a school. Mm -hmm. So it would look really good for them yeah. to work with us if there's a way we can get out and say. That'd be great. I'd love to learn more about it. So yeah, I don't know like Nancy if we know a lot of her. You know, the governor. So. Nancy Brown asked me that same question. The governor made the announcement, but it hasn't trickled down to yeah. the inner workings of how that's supposed to go out yet. So I think that will come here. I think we could leverage. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. I think it's great. I and mean, what an opportunity for kids. And, you know, wouldn't it be great to know if you like what you're doing before you can actually commit to doing it and, like, you know, have it? And that's a great way to do it. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I'm really fortunate on my end because of how many businesses approach and say those kids you're sending us are amazing and they represent both schools and the communities very well. So that's always great for you guys to work with that. Yes, that's great. Yes, my oldest son is just starting an internship at Brookings. I think it's Mountain Star. I was looking for it's a physical therapy. Right. Yep. Yep. Uh, we just have lots of paperwork to keep going through. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. He said it'd be a little bit, but he's we have a little bit. So thank you for what you're doing for that. <laughs> I love the opportunities that we have available. Okay, that's that's our end of our action items. Our information we already did the DLI and the Grass Creek School. So let's move on to our legislative update. I've been anxiously awaiting this. Well, it's um. <laughs> We actually, I believe, had end up having a very positive educational legislative session. And the joint legislative committee that we talked about quite a bit, um, just once again, a review of what that is, is it's a, a group of board members from throughout the state, and uh, they've been selected you know, by their boards and, and regions and areas. And then, um, there's a group of superintendents that also meet every Friday during the legislative session, and that makes up the actual joint legislative committee. And whenever we go to meet there, they always uh, the rule is that there's always at least one more board member than there is superintendent. And then we have business administrators that are there as you know the information guys, the numbers guys, when we need that kind of help. You know what is this actually going to look like for us? And um, Lexi Cunningham, who is the USSA, that's the Utah School Superintendents Association. She's the executive director for us, our organization. She's the assistant executive director for the USBA, and she is the lobby for the legislature. That's one of her main roles all year long. She's she's the lobbyist for the USBA and the USSA. And so Lexi is um, you know, constantly on the hill, she's the one that sent the reports out to you. Um, and she um, has the, you know, she sent that, I believe, during this weekend. She sent the last one. And so, um, Keith, if you wouldn't mind, I believe, um, I'm not sure which one of those two is, is the one I want. Try the first one, if you wouldn't mind. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, that that is, uh, she had a nice little draft there. Uh, I read it for hours, but this is the one that gives a little uh, definition. I actually tried to figure it out, but I, I really, I'm not going to lie to you, I didn't. I, I looked at it, and I think I can be honest. I, it, it, Samuel Clements or Mark, Mark Twain, one of the others said that, that there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. And that bar graph, I think, was one of those three. Anyway, um, this this report is really good because it gives a little demonstration or a, a little taste of what the actual bill is. Keith, if you go to the second one, we might have to toggle back and forth. You when you say the, second, the second one, right? The the one the, the so second the second out of the three. Yes, please. Thank you. Well, and Superintendent, yeah. if I can add, uh, as we're discussing these bills, a lot of times we won't take a stand on a bill for a number of reasons. Uh, one, there may be another general where more people will come there. Hope, hope there's some substitutions. Um, we've talked with some legislators that might be working on something, and we don't want to get them mad at us right off. Yeah. So as you go through and there, uh, the oppose and support, there's a lot that we took no, we took no stand on. 
and there and there's a number of reasons on that. So the numbers aren't quite as clean as it would look. And since there's over 100, I just highlighted a few that were hot items. And right off the bat, you see that one I highlighted, Senate Bill 114, that's the public school curriculum requirements. And that's the one that uh, the education community in whole came out. Uh, UEA, JLC, teachers, uh, there's another teachers association, I can't remember what it is, but, but they all came out and basically it was very similar to what we had the question today when Mr. Rasmussen shared what he shared with us and what Shane Lin did mention that we can't necessarily tell you exactly what we're going to be teaching a month or two months in advance because we have to um, evaluate how much the teacher the students learn and uh, then maybe reteach. Another point is it's been a great couple of years to have some really great discussions, especially I think in secondary schools about some of the political things that are happening. I mean, the, how the pandemic, how us, the sickness turned into such a political uh, situation. And I think it's healthy. Now, it, it, it behooves us as leaders and building principles to make sure our teachers are doing a good job explaining the situation and not sharing a leaning one way or the other. And uh, one of the, I, I think I've said this in front of this group before, but um, in Utah, there's 40 school districts, and then the 41st school district is considered a school for the deaf and the blind. And Joel Coleman is the superintendent of that, of that organization. And he made a statement in the discussion about this very bill that his son, not sure which high school he is in, in Salt Lake, I don't know which one, but he and his classmates are in an AP history class or AP government, I don't recall which. And they said they had such great discussions and their goal was, was to find out if their teacher was a Republican <laughs> or a Democrat. <laughs> and they honestly never could, is what he said. And to me, that is exactly what it's all about. And it, it's been hard in, in this environment to lean and, and almost be so tribal that it, it's, it's hurtful. And so that is one of the jobs that I think this bill was trying to help us with. And, and some of it was, of course, to prevent uh, critical race theory. I, I, I'll just say it out loud. So uh, as you can see, we took no position because it it was just one of those things that it looked like if we took a position against putting what our curriculum was out there on the wires that we wanted to try to hide. So we didn't take a position, but we did fight it underneath. Um, if anybody sees one, uh, Keith, you, you're already there. Uh, I jokingly said I like this, uh, well, cardiopulmonary because I am older and, and but more seriously. <laughs> You'd like the kids to say you go? Yes. More seriously, you can see that we opposed it and you'd say, why don't we oppose CPR training? And it's just, where do you do it? It's an unfunded mandate. How do you, you know, how do we, you know, we're gonna have to hire the nurses to come in and do it. And anytime we have unfunded mandates, we basically say, we we don't have a place for it right now. And I, I that's why we opposed it. So let's see, uh, grow your own teachers, supported it, passed teachers and counselors. I'm not sure how much money there was involved there. Once again, I, I think there's some seed money for some schools to start some districts to try to do that. Um, I threw in that resolution, just wanted to show you that they just do something kind of symbolic sometimes to honor the PTA. Keep going up. Um, this HB 42 could be one of the best things that maybe has happened. I don't know what the answer is, but I started here five years ago and Gary joined the next year and we've been doing safe school violation hearings and, and as of late, Gary's taken over most of those. And we went from that first year, I think I had about five or six safe school violation hearings. And the next year might've been 10 or 12. Last year, Gary's done the math. I think we did 20, 23, 23. And today and yesterday, Gary did 10, am I correct? Five and five? The last two days, yeah. the last two days I've done 11, 11. And that put us at 83. Yeah. And I'm not gonna say it's because of this bill. I think it's a lot of other things, but some of it is the kids know that right now, this year alone, that you cannot tell a kid, you gotta go to school. 
or else we'll turn you in for truancy. There's not such a thing. And kids look teachers and principals in the eyes and say bad words to them and say, I'm not going, what are you gonna do about it? And it ends up leading to, you know, willful, the word we have in our, in our policy, it's policy 5005, if you want some good reading, it's the policy that Gary lives by and, and I live by. And Gary actually, sad to say, we had some papers that he met with some third and fourth graders this week. And so it, it's it's going down that far. But I really believe that what happened in, it was, um, how good's your memory? It was Lowry Snow's bill about four years ago, HP 239. I think you're right. That number rings a bell. And what he did was, there was a, a report called the Pew Report, and the Pew Report was a nationwide report that talked about the school to prison pipeline. And the research showed that the sooner a student was in a court system, the more likely that they would end up in prison. And so they did not want students to be in the court system based on truancy. And so they basically took away our ability to put kids in the court system if they're habitually truant. And there was even a point in time for the elementaries that you could actually bring parents to habitual truancy and, and get them to get them to school. That's not the case. One of these young people that I, I believe it was today, Gary, correct me if it was yesterday, that the parent, I'm not saying any names, was on a Zoom call from another state. And he says, I'm really interested in my daughter. Daughter? Son. Son, I apologize. Having a great education. And how many days have they missed so far this year? 47. 47. Out of 100 and how many days do we have right now? Shade, and I thought you'd know right like, today. We had the 100th day. There's 58 left. Well, my daughter can tell me. Okay. <laughs> so 100, 120 something. It's just, just about <laughs> half of this. Yeah. And we can't do Not anything like, other than please come to school. We want you to come to school. And so this bill brings back well, what we call is the backstop, and that is that if you've done enough interventions in the school to try to help this student understand how important it is to come to school, you can then turn it over to the court and they can be uh, cited for habitual truancy. We asked as a JLC to give it three more years, please. And Representative Snow actually extended that to five. He's been really good to work with. I think his intentions are honorable. And, you know, but I, I think it's it's really been one of the big things that, that's hurt us. And I and I do think the pandemic, just the civil unrest there's been in our country, you know, over a variety of things, has just led to a meaner, less civil world that our kids are living in with their parents. And it's trickling down to us pretty, pretty dramatically. And so I'm excited about HB 42 to be able to get back not that I'm running around, oh boy, we get to throw kids in jail for being, that's not it at all. But there's a certain percentage of the kids that need to know that that's there so we can get them to school. So I believe strongly in that. Um, HB 103, Student Intervention Early Warning Program, Box Elder School District actually started in that um, um, pilot three years ago, four years ago, has it been five? Every, ever since I've been here, we started. And Daryl Eddy kind of the lead on that. And uh, it provided money to buy a, an early warning system called Panorama. And we're able to put information in there, run the numbers, and it, and it, and it really gives you some good information on, on students and, and the possibility of them not graduating from high school, uh, a variety of things. And so now with this bill there, that's being um, funded statewide to pay for the Panorama software. HB 114, um, you know that you may or may not know, but Bonnie uh, works hard with her staff and they've been ex exceptionally stretched in with the pandemic. But this is, um, I think there's also seed money in this to, to try to start to get a little bit more money to, to uh, allow us to have a few more uh, nurses. We do have a grant from Fair River Health Department. We're trying to get to extend one more nurse and, and Gary has through going, going through those safe school violations hearings, he's included uh, the nursing and um, they've worked a lot with via and via strengths and they've actually been a connected especially believe it or not we had a, a stretch where we had a lot of middle school age young ladies that were caught vaping uh marijuana and so we felt like we just needed more help with 
connections and keeping it going. And so these nurses have volunteered to try to go out maybe on a weekly basis, check in with the young lady saying, hey, how you doing? You know, and, and giving them some support other than just because in our policy 5005, basically. You know, you're not coming to school and you're being willfully disobedient, so we're going to kick you out of school for a few days. I mean, that's that's kind of the one tool in our, our tool. Well, and luckily, Gary's come up with some ideas to, to try to and I, and I think so far we felt that's been working really good. So if we had more nurses, definitely would help. Keep going up there. Next page. Uh, teacher professional development amendments. I think that has to do with our what we've started to doing already this year using those four days. And it really gives us a lot of incredible flexibility of how to use them even more. And, and so uh, we present that to you next year. We do have those days already scheduled in our in our uh, uh, program. Yep. No. Nope. <laughs> HP 193. Um, we talked a lot about that and originally they had uh, said they were going to fund it all the way. But I believe at the end they actually funded it for 12 million dollars. And so. What that's going to be is just a little bit of an expansion. Uh, 12 million dollars for us, Rod, uh, 2 percent, 1.8 percent. How fast can you do that math in your head? Six, less than six is it 600,000? So, if that's the case, we probably could get another five, five more, basically five more kindergartens, full, full day kindergartens. So, it's going to be, you know. If we have space for them, and Corey's here, and don't shake your head. I'd say yeah, we'll turn. Having this conversation when I saw this was going because we've, that budget that's been increased over the past two years, and last year we added an additional one century. Yeah. And so we would, well, I saw this, I was pretty sure it was like passed. So. But it passed, but not nearly as much money as they originally. Two percent is in six hundred. Okay. It's about two hundred. Oh yeah, it's two hundred forty. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you're really looking at maybe one to two, well, maybe two teachers, two. maybe three, maybe two. If it's one point, if it's one point eight, it's not going to be three. If it's two. It could be three. It's one point eight. Yeah. Sorry, I did the math. That's all right. I put you on the spot. Get ready. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I've got quite a gap there. Um, I I decided that time, Keith. Would you go back to those links? And I, yeah. I talk and do the one that I believe says Lexi Cunningham. Yeah, we could do that. I just asked her what her opinion was because she's there all the time. What her opinion was on what was the most um, helpful, and I guess what was also the most harmful. And she kind of kept it more positive than that. But definitely education friendly. Uh, that H SB one twenty seven early literacy outcomes improvements. Senator Milner, uh, I still don't know exactly what that that means, but we'll work through that. Uh, that half day, that full day kindergarten we already talked about. Uh, use of public education stabilization account. And I believe that money is what was through Amendment G, and that allowed them, them being the legislature, to uh, offer or not offer, but increase the WPU by six percent. And so that's going to be. Uh, it should hopefully turn into a, a reasonable raise. And I need to say this in a public meeting because it's always hard to understand 6% of the WPU does not automatically turn into a 6% on the cost of living adjustment or the COLA. Because when we talk about 6% of the WPU, there's a, there's health insurance that we're gonna, we've had a little bit of an increase. Every year it costs for um, us to do our steps and lanes because everybody's moving up. And it'll take Rod some time once we have a little better fixed uh, feeling of the number of people who retire. Because if somebody retires making eighty thousand and comes in making forty five, there is there is some savings, but that's not always the case because we do lose veterans making eighty eighty five, but sometimes we replace them with people from other districts or states and we give them their their years, so they might come in making sixty five or seventy. So there's not always a ton of savings there. So Rod will have to do the work on that one to get that one figured out. Um, HB 396 paid professional hours for educators. Uh, they'll be paid 32 hours over the course of two years time. And I need to understand how much better that works, but I, I believe that sounds to me like 
the well shows are right there. It's your planning, professional development, teacher directed learning. So 32 basically is four days. I mean, we I think our seven and a half hours is basically our teacher contract. So and that's what that means is they gave us the money to do it. And so even though there would might be a three, four, five percent cola, teachers could work a few more days and you know make make that extra money. That 251 I talked about. Yes, ma'am. So is that what we're already doing, or is that money in addition? That money would be in addition. That one. That I see that, uh, and I'm not exactly sure. Yes. But I see that as maybe two additional days during the summer that they, and I don't know if that's district led or or individual led. We've got to work more. That is additional. That one is yes. So I'm pretty excited that you know they recognize that teachers can use more BD planning, all those types of things. Not so education friendly. Uh, the Hope Scholarship. Um, it was defeated, and what that is is that that's a scholarship that really, in some way, shape, or form, basically was a scholarship to just about anybody to, to go to any form, charter, private, whatever the case might have been. And so we defeated they take it. Out home school. Yes, they did. A they did have homeschool in there, so you couldn't get paid to stay home and take care of your kids. Yeah. So that's a good one that, that was defeated. Um, but that will come back. It will, it will come back. Robert Adams has already talked about it. SB 62 Special Needs Opportunity Scholarship Program, and that's very similar. It's a voucher for special needs students. And already we have the Carson, <laughs> Carson Smith, Smith. the Carson Smith Scholarship, and they say that goes unfilled every year. There's not enough kids. To, so we already have a scholarship set up to help students uh, with special needs, you know, to go to all unique uh, learning facilities. And so we just felt like that would be a good one not, but once again, that will probably come back. There's a lot of these just circulate every year. Bills to challenge local control, public school curriculum requirements. We talked about that. Parents' rights in public education. And, you know, we definitely believe in parents' rights. We just, I think tonight was a good example of some Chinese dual emergent folks coming, wanting to be involved, and we're gonna find a way to incorporate them in, in this decision. Um, HB 234, you know, public educator curriculum transparency um, requirements. You know, it, it, it sounds like you know, we're trying to hide something, but very simply, it's just extremely onerous for teachers to have to go through that incredibly long process and have things out ahead, you know, a month or two. And with the year that our, the two years that our teachers have had to put another Another thing on their plate would just be too much, and, and our, our JLC and, and the UEA supported that too. And, and uh, they, the USBE um, wanted another uh, position, and right now it's left me exactly what that was, um, ombudsman, but exactly what that was to do, I, I really don't recall, but we felt like it was, I don't know, I, there's not too many talking about the bill where if they didn't like the board decision, that they could go to the state and yeah. appeal it. They they would be that's right. They were the the complaint committee person. And there's already then that, they could come back and hammer us. And that's already out there. I mean, there's still a, a complaint hotline in state office of education. I've been sitting at home relaxing and got the phone phone call several times for them saying, Hey, this has been reported. I'll, you know, would you go investigate and get back to us? So there's, it's already available, but they just have kind of a, an answering service there at the state office. I think that actually sits there 20, must be 24 seven, at least it must've been eight or nine o'clock. I've had a couple of those calls. So at least they're there for the time. Now, if you go up to the next page, um, once again, another education sovereignty and curriculum transparency, it did not pass. And, you know, I think a lot of this has to do with critical race theory. Some of it has to do with you know, there was a lot of uh, discussion about library books and pornographic material in library books, or, or at least books that just didn't meet the, you know, the cultural norm of the community. And so that's that's been a struggle that didn't pass. But there's a pretty strong group of folks in the state of Utah, it's Utah Parents United, and they're they've been able to wield a lot of. of, of strength and I believe they're going to get bigger. So and changes to educational governance. I apologize. I really don't know what that one is. But I'll I'll definitely look that up. 
And then she put on there, there'll be continued discussion about educating your earmark in the Constitution. That's there was a, a fear that we had, I think, this second to last week, we went to the JLC and the Speaker of the House and Ann Milner representing the Senate came and talked to us about. Once again, you may or may not know. Um, our income tax is earmarked to go towards education. Uh, and at the last election, there was Amendment G to change the Constitution, so a portion of that went to some special needs programs. I think there was for special needs, uh, high at risk kids, and then maybe some. But what the problem has been, if this is a problem, is that right now Utah is doing so well economically that they have so much money coming from income tax that they don't know for sure what to do with it. And I just need to say public, they don't want to give it all to public education. So what they want to do is, is come to the youth, to the education committee community and have a dialogue and see if there's any way they'd be willing to help pass an amendment. They know that if they don't have the education community, that they won't be able to pass an amendment on, on the Constitution at a general election. So they want to work with us, try to find a way so that they can restructure some of that money to go to roads, probably roads as much as anything. The official word was the artificial roadblocks. Yes. So the protections that we are grateful for, they want it. Yeah. And, you know, there is problems. They, they, you know, the state doesn't get the same number of raises we get, supposedly, and there's some things like that. So it, it is a problem, but that one is going to come. The trouble of it is it does have to be on an election year, and so they've got to wait two years really to, to, to do that one again. And that's why, I don't know, it must have been a kind of a last-minute scheme, and there was a hot weekend, and then by Monday or Tuesday next of that next week, it, it went for not. Uh, that um, vouchers. We'll continue. If, you, if you've been in education long, I would guess it was 12, 15 years ago, we had an incre incredible voucher bill. Howard Stevens was pushing, and it would have been really hard on education. Luckily, that didn't pass, and uh, we fought that one. There, the last two or three years, we've been kind of living in a little bit of a really great area. In my 21 years as superintendent, we had more trust and understanding between the legislature and the Education committee that we had in that previous 18 or 19. This year, it seems to be deteriorating again. There's, there's reasons for that. Probably the biggest reason is, is that there's a high turnover in the legislature. And the new ones come in, they come in with a plan, they listen to their constituency or a certain portion of their constituency, and they want to change something. And a lot of times, they're bull in the china closet. They want to change something, but they just don't know all the collateral damage that it has. And that's the JLC's responsibility to make sure that that doesn't happen. So uh, the last thing is on the next election year, what should be prepared for? So any thoughts, questions? Um, so some things I'd like to add. Yeah. So we came out of that second to the last week meeting just stunned like deflated balloons when we had Milner and <clears throat> Wilson talk to us. And I sent you all that email saying what was happening. And so the next week we walked into the meeting all kind of feeling like we were going to be attacked. And the governor walked in, had his had no tie, had his shirt open, and he was very frank. He was uh, very, he said, we've got to fix education. He said, we've got two two years to completely fix and figure out how to refund education. And it sounded like he's the one that called Milner and Wilson and he told us that he said, we can't do this. And then the challenge that he gave us is districts. And he said that the board needs to do it, not the administration. So I'm sure that's why the superintendent didn't mention that. If you heard on the news, the super or the governor talked in a couple of schools. He said it's the hardest work he's done in years. Went home absolutely exhausted. But he challenged every school district in the state to get every one of our legislators teaching in schools. So, Madam President, um, that we have been challenged by the governor to find ways to get our educators into our schools. Um, so, I mean, it can be simple. You know, Joel Ferry, Matt, or Scott Sandel, they can obviously do 
uh, political classes, history classes thing. Um, I was very disappointed with Mac Wynn's vote. Uh, he is not friendly to education. He is not supporting us like I'd hoped. Um, I, anyway, I was, so we really, really, really need to work on him. So let's get him in teaching police science. Let him get, let's get him in doing some things and where the majority of his work is really in Weber County. We need to let him know that we are here. But I just, and I talked about it years ago, but I just remember how just flummoxed when I took Pete Knudsen in to see our dual language classes. He had no context, but he thought he knew education, but he hadn't been in the school for 25, 30 years. And when we, we took him in and said, this is what the kids are learning and spent four hours with him going to different classes, he was just stunned and it changed his attitude, though he did sit right next to our seats and, and that, you know, but anyway, the more we get these legislators in our classes and working, and he said, have them teach the class. And so we got put some lines together, talk with them, see what they're doing. Um, I did talk to Scott Sandal about that. Um, and he's, he said he'd be willing to go. So we need to get, plus it's an election year and they want to look good. So I think we can get everyone at the map and say, go, you know, we, we can put it together. We talk to them so they'd be interested in teaching. Uh, the governor said he, the teacher prepared the lesson plan and gave it to him the night before, not knowing who was going to teach that class, <laughs> not knowing that it was going to be the governor. And he said, he got the materials the night before and went over and went through it. And he was teaching in sixth and seventh grade, seventh and eighth grades. It was, you know, mid grade. Anyway, he said he worked really hard to get his lesson plan in alliance with what the teacher had prepared. But um, anyway, and we we got to, and vouchers will be back because both the governor has said and he publicly said on the radio or TV and in this meeting he likes vouchers. Stuart Adams told us he likes vouchers, so that will be coming back. But we have been given two years, and the governor said, "Give us your best and brightest minds." Give us your innovators, give them people that can think through public ed. And he's even talking, he said, I know it's a sacred thing, but even talking about possibly restructuring WWE. Because as the superintendent said, our people look at it and say, oh, 6% increase. And and all the state people say, oh, but how about us? How about us? And the business administrators are saying, we pay all the insurance for our people and the state covers. So the, when they're saying apples to apples, we are apples to kumquats yeah. in what they're trying to measure us through. They're 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 trying to say how much they're giving education when in reality it's not level. And and the governor said flat out that it was it squandered. He taught he said flat out, we've been stealing your money for years and putting it in other places. Yes. And we all saw each other like someone admitted it. Yeah, <laughs> because we've all known that. And he flat out said, "We've been moving it around, and now we've got to deal with it." And so I, it was. We went home much happier that day. Oh, it was. It was a nice, nice drive home. That's really good to know, Nancy. Thank you. I, I will talking about a political thing. Um, the last day of the candidacy registration, a lady named Camille Knudsen. The board president to the school file to run against Scott Sandel. Yeah. So, and I I know Camille. My son actually coaches her kids, so I've got to know her over the years. She's a wonderful, great lady. But Scott Sandel votes for public education better than any other senator in the state. He's been a friend of education, mm -hmm. and he when things are hot, he called me the other night because he was really nervous about how to vote. Uh, he called me SB2. Oh, what was it? Um, and it was one of those that ended up getting served. 211. Yeah. 211. He called me and he said, How do I vote? And I was like, I haven't been tracking. And I felt terrible to let him go. Well, so it was, so. it was, we, we actually had the JLC had taken no position because it was a no win. I can't remember right now what to do. So but. it's, it, what it was, it's the fees bill. And we, oh, asked, we, no we should ask, USBA had asked. For the legislature to run this to fund school fees that we are losing, but they never put any money. In. They they wrote it, they presented it, and so Scott said, "Well, I got Terry Rhodes, so I got Terry here from Cash." It's like do whatever she tells you. Um, but 
it's it we were in a very difficult spot then because we had asked specifically for this bill to be written and uh, they didn't fund it. So they were just in essence doing exactly what we have to do, saying you get to take care of all the fees. Eh, there's no money. We did oppose it last week. JLC did oppose it last week. Superintendent, I have a question. Um, I just read in some of the major things there was a bill that uh, talked about um, had, uh, women's sports for transgender. And I think it passed, but then I read that the governor said, you told us what. Can you give us any more? You bet. Um, well, the bill to not allow mm -hmm. transgender females, especially to compete in the UH UHSA, was passed. and. You probably, I don't know if you saw it, but on the news, he was actually pretty emotional about it. And, but I have read that the uh, bill sponsor wanted, hopes that the governor doesn't uh, feel it because they want to form a committee to really get into this thing and figure out how to, how to deal with this. And so the bill was passed not to allow them to compete. Well, the biggest problem was it was substituted from the original bill because the original bill had a commission that people would go to and and I hate to say appeal, but talk away, figure out where they would fit and how it was go together. And the very last that was gutted and it was and that and that's the problem with that bill because they completely gutted any of the intent, intent of that and then just put in just an absolute rant. The governor's concern was the feeling of hopelessness for children who are transgender and feeling like that we not listen to them and give them a chance to, you know, to be heard. And so I um, I was pretty it was pretty emotional when we spoke. So it, it it is a it's a tough question, Mark. And I don't know that what what was what college was it? And okay. that's a uh, transgender lady that smashed every NC two A division. Yeah, yeah. so for next year. Yeah. They won't compete. They won't compete. Well, ours is a state rule. A state rule, yes. Yeah. Just they might compete at hey. UHSA. Hey, I don't I don't know about college. I don't know. Well, I mean for, for our UHSA next year. So we don't know what this comes. Yep. Okay. There was just one other one I wanted to mention that from an HR standpoint, they had a it never got enough traction, but the idea that Typically, you have to sit out one full year after retiring as a teacher to come back and make regular salary. And um, the, the bill was you could sit out for 60 days, which is we have a bill now that said you can sit out 60 days, but then you are limited on how much you can make, which is 17,000 a year. So we might have a teacher retire and then come in and be a para, um, but to have a teacher retire, Next year, I'm at that age where I could retire. But if I wanted to retire, be a teacher, if a teacher wanted to be a teacher at age 54, 55, whatever, they could still retire. Um, anyway, it didn't pass. It didn't, it didn't even got up for a vote. But the idea was, was to help increase the number of teachers uh, and also give them a chance to. Anyway, but that didn't. I talked to my buddy from, uh, he's a superintendent in Nevada. And uh, they have a, a law now in uh, Nevada that says that if it's a high critical need, you can retire and tomorrow you can teach. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing to combat in Nevada uh, so that there's not even a waiting period. So whenever I decide I want to retire, I retire, but if I'm in a critical need. And he says right now we're in critical need mode in every position. Um, and so that was an interesting perspective. We, we supported that as USDA. We did. Yeah. We but anyway, just we never. Did. I don't know why. Anyway, it'll be interesting to see how they deal with those types of things. So I've got a question. Sorry. This is I'm I'm trying to understand all this legislative stuff. I don't. But um what can we I like I, what can we do? I mean, I'm all for getting our legislators in the classroom. And so my question is, do we need to, what's the next step? Do I talk to the schools and say, where, or do I talk to the, like, what, what's the next step? <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, we can talk to them and, you know, it's a good during, especially during a campaign year. Yes. It's a great public relations. So I think we can reach out to them and, and set up some good situations. And, you know, I think they ought to hit an elementary. I personally exactly. think, Going to teach the elementary would be the hardest thing in the history of the world. Yeah. Now, some people, to me, go teach 
anything, even though I wouldn't know the content in high school, high school it would, I could have fun. But I, I, so I think it would be good, you know, if we did a little campaign and, and we can reach out to, to our, to our, at least the two that we okay. have good relationships with. Well, let's talk about that and make a, a yeah. plan, at least to invite yeah. them, whether it's in the fall or whatever. I think that's a great I think it'd be good if they did it now. Or now, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 So the second question is about vouchers. What is the impetus behind this bill? They don't trust public ed. Is that the, they don't feel like, are we having, are, is that, uh, I guess that's my question because I have a brother-in-law who works for a charter school company and he, he's like the finance guy or whatever for it. And it's, uh, you know, he feels very strongly that there's a need for those schools because we're not providing what, anyhow. And I can, I can listen to him and I can understand what he's saying. And I think for some kids, and I, I believe that parents should have a choice and they do have a choice, but I, don't think we need to fund every choice that people want to make, I guess is my my thing. And so that's my question is where is this coming from? And I know it keeps coming, but so there is a National American Association of something legislators. We call it ALEC. The legislators go every year to a meeting in end of August, September, where ALEC runs this and they bring in model bills, model legislation. And a lot of these bills you will see they're just ALEC bills all over them. And they spread them out nationwide. And you will hear different school districts, particularly at NSBA, talking about, you know, oh, we've got this one. I mean, it's so vouchers is a huge thing set up by individuals who think money should be allocated backpack funding where every kid gets a set amount of money and it goes wherever. And that's part of the issue. So what we're saying is you as yay on vouchers is it, these are public tax money. These are public funds and to send them to an entity. So if you go to promontory, you have no idea how they're spending their money. On a charter school, their charter school board meets. You can go to that, but they don't have to report to the public how they're spending our tax dollars. And I've used this before, but if they wanted to heat their building by piling all the money in the middle of the foyer, lighting it on fire to heat their building, they could do that, and we have no recourse to say no. So that's part of the reason the local districts and the USDAs and all oppose this is because it takes the public taxation money out of the clear view and all the things we go through in terms of taxation and all that, these other entities don't have to do. So the vouchers, they have set them up. They say, oh, but it's just low income. But if you look at these vouchers, you can make 555% over the poverty line and still qualify for vouchers, which the numbers they were saying were like $350,000. Your family can make and be qualified as a low income and qualify for voucher money. So I've got good friends in Arizona who, the charter schools in Arizona can bond uh, for buildings. The, the school system in Arizona is running amok because their public funds are going to so many different entities, they're really struggling. So the voucher is, yes, we understand, we want to be compassionate, we want to help these kids, but in a lot of cases, you get very wealthy families who learn how to play the system and take the money and put their kids, and it doesn't trickle down to the kids who could really use this. So that's, I know this is our comment, that, that helps me, thank you. So for any other, I mean, that's just kind of a discussion, I know this is not any, sorry, this is something that's, but like, what is the, like, what else can we do that's, I mean. Well, like, they talk all the time in JLC, it's just getting good relationship with your local legislators and kind of okay. following them. And when the time comes, reach out to them and talk to them about, you know, then when we meet December, build that, know what's, what's coming down the pike and be able to, you know, I try not to overburden the guys, so I only send texts to, and, and I've never met Mac Wynn yet, so Joel and, and, and uh, Senator Sandal, Representative Ferry and, and Senator Sandal, I only send them texts when it's a hot issue that I really want them to support or I really want them to, to oppose, and I've told them that. If you hear from me, then that means myself and the, the group that I'm part of, JLC, 
very passionate about about this. And they've been very, you know, they always get back. Hey, I was already planning on voting against that, but thanks for the support or you know, you know, comments like that. So I think once you develop that relationship, then then the rest of it, you know, it's really what it's all about. It's about relationships. Well, and I think um, Scott and Joe have always been really good to come from. Yeah, it's really good. Um, I don't know this bad. I don't know you know, personally, but I think we need to work together. Or maybe two of us calling or something, encourage him to come because I think the cat would have heard us and sat down with us. I think that makes a difference. I mean, I'm sure he's a nice guy. I don't know what I'm Said to him. And, and just, you know, got our points over in a positive way. I think that would make us. Well, I think just understanding. Right. Good. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Hoping that one. Thanks, Wade. Okay. Sorry. That's that's just interesting to me, and it's uh, you know, it's, <laughs> but what we have, you know, we want the best for our kids, and we want the funds, and we know how tough it is sometimes to. Yes. Yeah, he's okay. Okay. Everything. So, okay. okay. Monthly finance. Any other questions? No. Everybody's fine. <laughs> like, out here, please. Okay. Monthly financial report. Um. Yes, I don't think that I added any um, new yellows caution in that uh, on the front monthly financial report. Um, it does it does appear that maybe um, our benefits are a little bit on I budgeted a little under our benefits and in some of the areas. So uh, we'll need to we'll fix that. Um, and insurance is going up next. Is that right? Yeah, there's. Yeah, yeah, so they are projecting a little bit of an increase. Um, we're hearing two to four. We've gone zero zero. Actually, we went negative three zero. After nineteen, so we're still in a modest. We had a rough first quarter. Let's just put it that way. Um, variety of reasons, not nothing that was really tangible. But anyway. We're still waiting. We'll get that firm number. Right. Quick question on the WP when we talked about this, you know, six percent of quite the six percent raise. Also, if, if you have like what's going on right now, gas is going through the roof with all those things and inflation. That it, it's not just all of our money we go to pay for teachers. We have a lot of things in WP is used for all of them. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the information we need to get out. Is as the the we we lived partially on property taxes too, and so when the legislature gives us funds, we we really uh, that six percent is only about eighty percent of our budget our budget in M and L, mm -hmm. and and so twenty percent of it's local. And then that was the thing that frosted us as as business administrators. They put up a couple of charts, and and they were showing the WPU increase over the last few years, and then they were showing the state and college cola increases, and we were ahead of them. But as we meant, as one of the business administrators mentioned, we are buying insurance out of our. WPU and insurance is is covered with the public with the state employees and with the colleges. Plus, we have to take care of fuel and utilities and all those other things out of our increases that they don't they weren't comparing on that chart. So the the superintendent's statement about statistics was so, so true that day. <laughs> and and uh, they tried to use that to show how we had gotten our fair share. And I have to be careful because I've been doing this for 41 years. And but I'm very frustrated that in 41 years we have never, until just recently, we we passed Idaho finally. But uh, it's like it's like. One of the VAs said he worked for the state office and they used to call it the Mississippi catch up. They were hoping we could at least catch Mississippi, which used to be the second lowest in the, in the country. Now we have passed 
Idaho, but um, part of the reason we passed Idaho is because we used to not report non anything that didn't affect instruction did not go into our reports for calculation of of per pupil costs and the state has changed our accounting to where we're adding those things in to try to make us look better. Lies. <laughs> Damn so, lies. <laughs> so uh, it's very it's very frustrating to me that in 41 years we have never we really haven't made any leeway in comparison to the rest of the country. Might I just ask, since we're talking about I know Keith and Carrie, could you join me in and here we have on. Anyway. Can you guys sing it? Anyway, let's stop. And romance I'm sorry. We fall. I do think Chuck Rod's last meeting. We need to have him say what he really thinks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, when I started, I have to say one more thing. I, I, did, I did bite my lip. The year I started, 1981, they they did what they called float the WPU. They came up with the recession had hit, and they came out this time of year and told us that they had to cut 4% off from our budgets. We're halfway through the year, and, we, and we're 85% employees employee costs and we had to find four percent and then they promised us they'd never do that again and they haven't ever done that again they just don't give us as much money every year so, <laughs> so i don't know uh the governor made a good point he said um uh, school finance is so complicated that and legislators don't get it and then they turn over every two or three years and so we never get the message to them yeah. that's that's the hard part about it when i was talking to joel ferry um he said the average age of or the average tenure of the legislature is six years so the turnover is that quick and the, and the understanding and we've got to train them every year interesting but are there any are there any other questions other than that I can't do the math on twelve million dollars? Okay. I had to use a calculator because I thought that seemed a little high, but I couldn't pull it off. Randy, you probably had it, didn't you? Yeah. I say in my head like Randy I was I think about twelve times two, right? There's twenty four. So yeah, yeah, that's what it's I get to it. That's the estimation. Is that what you do? Yeah, you put me on the spot. Rock usually comes up with those pretty quick. <laughs> Well, thank you for the uh, financial report. Of that. I think it looks good and there's. You've done such a good job <laughs> keeping us where we need to be. Yeah, and and just if I can say the one thing my experience about me, we're going to go hear more about these bills and there's all the devils in the details too. you know what the yeah. superintendent's giving you as a 30,000 foot view and when we we the kindergarten bill may very well be I don't know maybe Carrie knows but it may very well be an application process where you apply for the money or something you know so you never know for sure what you're doing what you're getting and they kept talking about 250 million dollars and we might get that to build for building and I've never heard what happened to it. I haven't I, I don't know that every, yet, every legislator had a different use for it but he kept saying but there's this 250 it was million. it was never in a bill so we probably didn't get it but we were kind of hoping to get that that would have been about four million dollars to us so. which is why we negotiate in late April early May yeah. so we can get through all the details and say what does that really mean for Fox Seller and Town but thank you you guys for your support Okay, board committee reports. I don't think we've had any committee meetings. Maybe I've seen. Okay, so policy review. We're all on second readings here. I'll move we approve the policy okay. of the second reading. Okay, we have a motion by Nancy. Second review motion. We're tag teaming down here. To approve the policies on second reading. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, um, 
Okay, I, I move we uh, move book study slate. Okay. <laughs> Say that in your way. I have. <laughs> well, I'm also going to put you on the list to call on you. I heard you're going to get it. I think y'all will. Because <laughs> I was like, it's board members and students. So yeah. Okay. She said there are a couple of <laughs> okay, does anybody, is everybody okay with moving to study? If you have something yeah, thrilling that you want to share with email, you don't want this book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. It's like, it has to be laughed. You want to add section three as well. <laughs> Let's do section two and section three next month. Yeah. Next month. We'll get through it and um, we can do that. So our board committee assignments, I know I said this out and just to clarify what everything does everybody understand your board committee assignments. And, um, I did talk to the superintendent about the capital improvement committee because we have eight board members. We should be okay because you have to have five to pass anything. So having four for this little intern is not gonna kill us more. We have some just little three year intro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. All we have coming up by the capital committee. Um, I would Possible. I would like to make that a committee that everybody can. Yes. Well, and that's one of the things I mentioned that I I think I mentioned in the email, but that might be a committee where we can actually make it available to everybody in Zoom committee or a Zoom or make it for those who want to participate to observe. Um, I, I would like to make it an all participating one. So, so, uh, so make it all the board meeting. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Oh, well, you, you can. You can have different meetings throughout, and as long as you notify, yeah, I mean, yeah, it'd be a work set. It's so not like, work yeah, well, it'd be like session. a work session. Yes. Like we do in July. We don't yeah. have a lot of public involved in our work session. No, we can, we can, I, I, okay. if we, if we, if you publicize it, you can do that. Okay, yeah. so here's my question. When do we need to, when is the next, because that means about quarterly. Do we have a meeting scheduled? Because I know Corey, oh, he's gone, but Corey in next month meeting was going to have, there's something on the, the future board meetings that has um, something of the capital improvement. Well, the last meeting we had was just a real quick one to prepare for the tree mark meeting. So yeah. we really didn't go into depth on anything. I was just going to say, where's that? I will talk to him tomorrow and get that out to you. Because if we want to do that, then we do need to notice it. And and uh, now the noticing yeah. isn't a, an issue. And I don't know if you saw, I'm sure the superintendent did, but there was also an article that like down in Tooele, they just passed the bond, but they're already what, 55 55 million million and yeah. so I know we've got a lot of things coming up yeah. that I think it, those meetings, that meeting, when I was on that committee, you get a lot of more information than you do just at the summary yeah. meeting. Yeah. Well, could we maybe do that as part of the work session of July? And by, by then, uh, we should have to some good numbers on where cap, what we've got in our capital. Yeah, right. yeah. I need some time to get us do that as like a work meeting yep. whenever it meets. Then yeah, anybody can come. Yeah. It, it can get real unwieldy to get. Well, that's my concern. Like, I'm, I'm a little concerned that if we have everybody yeah. there, it's that's why we have everybody to. would be there, only those that wanted to. And I know, right? I know um, Nancy wanted to come to one of the other meetings, and I was fine with that, and, and her info was good. So I think that. Um, if, if that one's possible, we could just do it as a work okay. If it gets out of hand, we can always readjust. Or you can give me permission to slap people around and I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> if you give me You're kidding I'm, or, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm well, I, I want it to be a productive meeting, and I think that if yeah. you want to be with one, one of my concerns, and this is my, is because if you have too many people there, or if it becomes uh, like a five, like there's three people that can't come in at any given time, and then it becomes yeah. a large subcommittee. Then it becomes that kind of defeats the purpose of the having it open to everybody as well. So if everybody would like to come and can come, I think if we have six out of eight there, that kind of leaves those two at a disadvantage if they can't come to all those work sessions. So I like the idea of having a work session in July to do that. But I, I I like your suggestion. I think we just need to explore it a little bit more before we and just you know, make it a complete open. I do think with Robert's help, we could we could zoom it. And yeah. uh, copy it, and somebody could just watch it later to get the information because I think just been in the you know. Well, I think to get the information, it's, it, it'd be good to hear about. It, but 
That's, that's, that's my concern is the unwieldiness and then it becomes like we really have five people showing up every time and it's a five member committee and then we have so you know so what I mean? When, so when I went to that three meeting, I didn't vote. I now I I talk, which I tend to do, but I didn't <laughs> vote. Well, and so, so that so that did so that eliminates it. But if you put a committee with everyone on it, then it does become that's my concern. But, but it, there's no voting in the subcommittees. Yeah. So anyway, okay, okay. Well, that's a good we'll suggestion. We'll all talk to superintendent. Next we'll time, we'll, I'll talk to Corey and see, see what the his next, next plan is. is to see when we need to. Uh, if, if we're all going to be needing to go out south to work to get the bonds, uh, yeah, it's kind of yeah, good. That, that background. background. Yeah, I, I certainly think we need the information for sure. Yeah, I just don't know how soon. I like I said, I like the idea. I just don't want it to become if everybody can't come. Yeah, I'm not explaining myself well, but. I want to, I just don't want to like hard commit to something right now. I think we need to talk about it and kind of look at the long term. So I need to think we need to talk to Corey about what the plan is and what things are coming okay. up. But yep. should we be ready for a, a motion on consent items? Yes. Move that we approve consent items. Okay, motion by Brian Smith to approve a second. Second by Nancy. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, upcoming events, make sure you have those on your calendar, graduations. Mm -hmm. And um you have missed suggestions for board meetings. Jay. Oh Jay. I've got two. Okay. Uh, I was invited um to do reverence at a uh, city um, board meeting. Uh, I guess they go out to various um religious organizations and invite them. I think that would be good maybe a couple times a year to invite to to offer a reverence. Um and then also, um, I, I'd like to. I, I know we've heard, and and Julia took some notes, and and uh, superintendent um, on what our uh, idea would be to uh, work with the folks that came and talked about the LI. So maybe a, a yes agenda so, item to talk a little bit yeah. about what what we think we can do um, to assist those parents. So just one random thought as they were talking, and I know you'll discuss this. <laughs> I've been a part of booster clubs for everything my kids were ever in. The fire department. Why can't they create their own booster club? And then do a lot of that stuff with them. I mean, we have guidelines on spending and money and all, but they're asking us to create an entity for them. Everything I've been on, volleyball parents, we created our own, did our own thing. Yeah. And stayed within the guidelines, but I see nothing wrong with them putting together a bunch. And I think they would. It's just that they need some information. Like yeah. me personally, I don't know all of the parents that are in Chinese DOI, so that I could talk to. I don't know who they are. So in the in the fire department, we just contact said, "Hey, we're here. These are the to come up." Yeah, but if we as a district can provide them some information to help them set that up. So are we going to? Um, so my takeaway from that, the Chinese, is I have these lists of things that they suggested, and I know we talked to Ashley saying you kind of do that. Do we want uh, a committee or something where she or a meeting with her? Do, well, I think we well, Ryan said, you know we could we could report. Yes, ma'am. Can I take a little? Sure. I just want us to be careful because as a as a school district, we support two programs. Yeah. And whatever we do for the Chinese culture, that's why I said DLI. I didn't spend, think yeah, can't be. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And so I think it's realistic that we have a cultural event. Do you know what I mean? I think it's realistic that we, for both cultures, do you know what I mean? I think it's realistic that we can help them set up a Facebook group that they can manage and decide who wants to be the rotating. I mean, those are seen as doable for both communities. And in those cultural events, having all of the schools in that, you know what I mean, be able to plan that event together. So it truly is a community thing. And I think too, it's realistic to have one or two after school activities. So when I was in China and visited those schools, that was some of the things that they did was having extracurricular activities that they just brought the community in. And we did, they did like some art projects that they did in China. We did some, some painting, we did some calligraphy work. Do you know what I mean? Just to kind of give some history and perspective. Um, so I think we can do something to help support that that's not daunting. Do you know what I mean? But it's, it's realistic to start out with and it's not that that then can't grow each year 
but I think we need to say here's a kind of a framework to yeah. kind of get us started to be able to balance both and represent both. Because yeah. Jeremy and I had talked about starting some extracurricular things um, with that when we were in China, because those are some of the things that we saw that they were doing and that that would be a great thing to do. But then COVID happened and we just haven't got back in time. Yeah. And COVID yeah. was a very much for our DLI. When I was looking at that report with Jeremy, that we lost like 19 kids that I mean that were in the program in March that did not return. Does that make sense? And the same thing happened in Spanish. Spanish was in stress because it was just 12, but that is the most drastic either program has been hit um, by, you know, Patricia at all was the COVID. It really did. There were just people who didn't keep up with that. And it wasn't a great model, but the state had in place to support yeah. the alive when that went all online. And some of these parents were here that have the ability to pay for a tutor and extra support that was different for those that didn't have that. Sure. I mean, so we recognize and like Ashley said, that was something that was brought up in her state meeting was that it's a statewide DLA or the uh, COVID on DLI program is a statewide, like everyone's feeling that. So I don't want Ashley, she just texted that he's ready to hire a full time DLI. <laughs> <laughs> so I think she's not feeling like, like, feeling like the weight on the and I think we can structure it in a way that we can accommodate a great yeah. way to have a forum where they can speak because that was a great idea. Mm -hmm. And I think we can create cultural events for both. And both, in, you know, with the Spanish up on that will be a little bit different because we wouldn't have a Chinese up there. But so that the schools are all talking and communicating and planning that event for the community, not for the students and families that did attend Foothill. That's kind yeah. of what it's doing yeah. right now. Yeah. But I think if all the schools plan that together, it could become a community event. Yeah. Who are the programs? Yeah, that's <laughs> what like, 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 it advertises right. that that it's part of. The so community. here's my question though: like we, if we have it on a future agenda, like what? Are we just going to talk about it again? Or are we going to do something? Well, I think yeah, I think going to report on. Actually, come with that. Yeah. Can we meet with her and bring you a proposal? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So we have something to talk about. And then if we met with her and kind of got a few ideas, and then we could present the proposal to you, and then we could meet with the community people because their yeah. their their ideas are going to be too audacious for us to take on. Sure. So we have to be able to kind of find a way to meet them yeah. and start small, and then we can continue. Oh, that was great. Maybe we could do four of those after school things next year, or. Because yeah. we all the people that have to run that are Chinese teachers, right? They have to be the ones. And so being able again to find funding to support the activity that we're going to do, funding to pay the teachers to post that after school activity. I mean, all those are things that. Well, that's why why can't the parents put an entity together and run that as their own thing rather than us right. dragging the charge? Mm -hmm. If we want parents involved, right? And I think they could definitely be involved as part of that. But a teacher. But I still don't think the parents can have the same effect on an extracurricular activity without that teacher that brings that culture piece yeah. to that. They're the yeah. ones who bring the so why we did that. This is what we do, and here's why we do it. Why this flipper, like in China, they explain the whole art project we did and why that was important as part of their Chinese teaching. The same with their calligraphy. I mean, I could mimic it, but it's not the same effect as the, the actual. Yeah, a teacher is there leading. No, oh, I thought they had good yeah. ideas because I don't want to put a whole burden on us to do everything. But right. I, like, like, thank you for clarifying what the next steps would be. Because I'm like, like, if we need to just run up, it is really realistic. And I'm not too sure actually, like, we're going to. Well, one thing I will add is I agree with all of what you said. It was, it's very yeah. evident from the day that we have a Chinese culture. Yeah. 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 We're, we're seeing a lot yeah. more kids yeah. drop out of China than, than Spanish. And, and I think. It's cultural, exactly what they said. Those ha happens right, happens right at seven. I think they mentioned about the teachers because I put those in the minutes too tonight. Their suggestions and some of those things their suggestion for teachers. They, those teachers are involved. For example, when they come, they all go to our first year teacher and their whole first year teachers program is all about classroom management. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're giving that. They're giving specific ex explicit instruction on student engagement. Now, I think it's harder for them to understand, maybe, and uh, understand yeah. how to do that because having visited their school, the training there, there isn't. And when we asked those teachers when we were in China, where are we didn't see any special ed rooms, we didn't see any functional skills rooms. And when we asked them, what do you do with a disruptive student? They looked at us with this funny look and they said, yeah. we don't have those. We call parent and they come get them. Yeah. Like, what she said is true. Like they don't come to school. Like you either come and play the role or you don't come to school. Yeah. And so that so what I'm just saying maybe they need to do we need to do an additional help because I think it just might not be as easy for them. Yeah, well, I'm saying it's got to be continued. I yeah. do and there's a variable that I don't know how to engage. And the gauge of having 
three classes each trimester or nine out of 18 down to six or four classes out of 18, just decreasing how many hours you get to speak the language is I think problematic. Um, I do agree with, you know, but you know, some of our Chinese teachers are American. Yeah. Um, and so it's not all cultural. It's not. Um, but I do think we need to look at all that, and that's certainly something we have to look at. But I also would beg, you know, going from nine classes in K, you know, in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then Randy, they go to, they did basically four or five, right? Three in the language, and either cultural history, media A, and B, yeah. maybe. Yeah. So they're going to five out of 18. And then eighth grade, as much as it's not, Eighth grade, and so that's, that's the juggernaut. The no. juggernaut is in eighth grade. When I was just ready to bring Chinese in, that was the juggernaut because there is just going to be elective choice. It might not be because of elective choice. I I agree with that, but there are no there is very limited choice, and so you that is another variable that may impact some. So I think those are kind of the three things we probably had to look at and say, we don't want that. I had, and this is a off the bench while we're on it. <laughs> no, we have you no, know, we have Latinos in action. Yep. These kiddos go into schools and help kids. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, when you start looking at could there be another if electives really are not the issue, could you have a class that could go in and tutor and it would be like Latinos in action and they would it would be one hour. Again, now we're at six, but it's at what cost, you know, to get them because we're gonna say we're just gonna go in and Tutor them well. When are they, what class are they going to leave to tutor, or do you make a class and do you say, "Hey, sign up for one of these during the trimester"? So there's a lot of creativeness, and I think getting teachers, principals of DLI, uh, Ashley, and parents together and say, "Okay, where can we really grow this? What supports?" You know, if we've got a problem with all these kids on parent release. Obviously, somebody's got some space. In their schedule. Somebody. That's what I'm saying. So now that's usually senior year. Yeah, None of them have gotten to that program yet. Yeah, None of our classes have got to see you. Yeah. I'm wondering what Washington School District does. That would be a resource. They're the number one most involved in the state with dual language. And I'm curious, that could be a resource. Of what are they doing to help develop the K-12 program? I know they're struggling just because they came to the tour Golden Spike last week and they knew that it was, they asked about, if it was introduced to them that it was a DLI school. And he said to me, and we explained, he said, if you had a problem, we kind of explained the problem at Foot Hill and we're looking forward to having more classes because we found out 600 is kind of the magic number. If you have 600 in the school, you can really run a nice, robust, good program. But underneath that, it just gets challenging with staffing. And because we have that all over our district and it is becoming a huge problem when I get to secondary. So Washington, it's true. Like if you don't have 600, you should not be allowed to open a DLA because it's just a, it's just problematic as far as the staffing. And then when they're not filling their pro he said, said we have all these programs that are not getting filled, and now we get to set the secondary and it's all getting the mess. And so I think we're not alone in. Oh, I think it's a Who's great saying, committee to be a part of, and so, let's see what we can do. But there's things we can do to meet these people and do both. I'm just like, we've got the Spanish, but we've got to be here, and you got to do both, and we got to start here, and then we can continue to grow and expand. We can have some great big families. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> group of parents also are so divided because the one group wants, they don't want tutoring, they want more reading and literature, and they want us to buy more curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then the other lady said, I don't have that gifted child, and I need tutoring. <laughs> and so then you dilute even more with a smaller population. But that group is, is, is very divided on what services they want for additional time. Which shows that the demographic of the classroom is very normal to every exactly. other right. classroom. Right. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. not just for, I wish that the, that the classic uh, sizes could be flipped. I mean, we we count on that attrition as they get older. When really we need the twenty in a class when they're first graders, not thirty in a class. Yeah, <laughs> it's backward. Yeah. But when you look at their data, their data is ahead. So I mean, like it's amazing when you look at their data. We check your book.
Anyway, we talk. We could talk for about the whole time. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion to go into closed session to discuss security. I'll second. Uh, by Karen Cronin, a second by Brian Smith. So we need to do a roll call vote. So Karen, we start. Yes. Are you hard? Yes. Honey Archibald, yes. Julie Taylor, yes. Yes. Brian Smith, yes. And security, yes. Clyde Wool Gamos, yes. Okay. So do we are we gonna move somewhere else? Yeah, yes. mine has to leave. I, no offense. But I don't have to be all here. We have is a motion. All we have is adjournment after, don't we? We could, yeah. we could go in the room when we're a work session. Does okay. Melissa need a place to stay tonight? That's what I told yeah. you. Yeah. Driving home? She's safe. She's safe. She's safe. She's safe. Oh, Thanks for coming. And the thing is, that she has to be back here in the morning at 8 30. Oh, I'm kidding. That's just down the road. I have stuff to do when I get to my kid. Better go. Make sure we'll get home until 11. Okay, let's go into. If you want to gather up your stuff, can we well, have our... just stay here? And can we stay there now? How long is it going to take you to? I'll do. I'll move as fast as I can. Okay. Well, you guys can be excused. Well, we'll take stuff down. Yeah. Okay. Hey, we if you want to take something as much as I don't want, yeah. probably, let's go with that other one. Let's go with the other one. We can do this. Let us clean up. You guys got to clean up. Yeah. Can you do? Uh, you have to come back into this. Yeah, we do. do. We have to come back. Well, I don't know if we need to. Do you Ron, you have the, have the recorder? I do. We can record it in the other room with the recorder. So you take your stuff. Yeah. I tell you, I got to tell you, let me feel like we're all putting up there. My daughter did want Ryan to go to share a teacher conference. She's like, you just 